Good evening. The Springfield Public Schools Board of Education September 2nd, 2014 study session is now in order. I let the record show that all members of the board are in attendance this evening with the exception of Mr. Hosmer, who will be here shortly. Uh, please join us in the Pledge of Allegiance to our flag. I pledge, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The next item on our agenda is the approval of our agenda this evening. So at this time, the board will approve the agenda for our meeting. So at this time, I'd like to have a motion to approve the Tuesday, September 2nd board study session agenda. Do I have a motion? So moved. Thank you. Mrs. Bush, I need a second. Second. Mr. Rosenberry, so at this time, uh, we will vote to approve the agenda. Good, thank you. It's a quick way to get off to start this evening um, with our new change of format and all our computers moved around, so that went pretty smooth. Thank you. <laughs> um, moving on to our public comments to address agenda items, uh, I just want to a little reminder the Board of Education welcomes comments from the audience about the issues being discussed. It is recommended that requests to speak be submitted prior to the beginning of the meeting. Comments will be limited to five minutes for each speaker and will be timed by Mrs. Luton. Uh, it's very important that you watch your time. It will show up on the um, screen for you. And at the end of five minutes, please uh, complete your statement. Uh, it is inappropriate to address the board about individual students or individual staff members by name in an open meeting. So if you have concerns about individuals, these concerns should be addressed through the appropriate administrative supervisors, either in the school or in the district. And at this time, we do have uh, a uh, speaker for an agenda item, and I would like to call uh, forward um, Glenda Thurkill. Good evening. I'm Glenda Thurkill. I'm Springfield MSTA co-president and MSTA state vice president. I'm speaking on behalf of Springfield MSTA. Tonight, you will discuss Amendment 3, which will appear on the November ballot. This amendment must be defeated because it takes local control away from parents, teachers, and school districts and hands it to Jefferson City politicians. This costly amendment is a one-size-fits-all approach to our children that would force taxpayers to spend money on even more government-mandated standardized tests. Teachers should not be fired or demoted based on student performance on a single standardized test given on one day once a year. This is the wrong way to measure teachers. Real accountability comes from principals regularly monitoring classrooms, having experienced teachers mentor others, and allowing parents more input in the process. Amendment three is bad for kids, bad for teachers, bad for school districts, and bad for taxpayers. I encourage you to create a resolution against Amendment three. We have recently watched many individuals and groups take the ALS Ice Bucket Challenge, including some of you in this room. I would like to encourage this board to not only develop a resolution, but also publicly share your resolution and challenge school boards from surrounding districts to follow your lead. The Ice Bucket Challenge raised a great deal of awareness and support for ALS research. An Amendment 3 resolution challenge would do the same in the effort to defeat this very harmful amendment. Thank you. Um, moving on to our information 
reports. Um, at this time, we have an update regarding our crossing guards. So um, an update will be provided to the Board of Education concerning the collaboration between Springfield Public Schools and the City of Springfield on securing a third party to manage all components of the crossing guard program, both inside and outside of the city. And the board will be provided at this time just a brief overview or review of the history, current actions, and next steps in our process. Dr. Harrell. Good evening, Dr. Frederick, members of the board. Thank you for giving me a few minutes to visit with you about the crossing guards. Pardon me. What you have in front of you and you have a copy of is a current ordinance as provided by the city. I've been working in collaboration with the city for some of the information that's held within this, this brief presentation this evening. So that is the current ordinance. When we look at specifics of the ordinance, the city previously has been in agreement with the Missouri Highway and Transportation Commission for crossing locations that are on the state highways. Currently, the city does not have any, any agreements because there are no crossing locations on the state highway system within the city limits. The city ordinance authorizes, but does not mandate, a school crossing guard program. Currently, there is no state law that would require that the cities nor the school district provide a crossing program. The city has reviewed other practices in other states and other cities, including school districts in, in, uh, within the state as well as without, outside of the state. And it's determined that there are really basically no consistent practices or processes. In some situations, the city has owned this, this particular component. In some situations, the schools have owned and managed the component. And in some situations, it's been combined. Currently, we have 34 areas that, are quali that qualify for a crossing guard. And that qualification is determined by the School Crossing Protection Committee. 27 of those occur within the city and seven within the county. The city hires, trains, and funds the program for the 27 in-city crossings and is managed by the Springfield City Police, the traffic unit supervisor, and assisted by a part-time coordinator. The school crossing guard locations are staffed twice each day, once in the evening and once in the morning. And then the school district has the same responsibilities for those outside of the city currently in the, in the county area for hiring, training, managing, and funding those crossing guards. Of those seven positions outside the city, six have traditionally been funded by the county. If you'll remember late last year, uh, the county stopped that particular funding due to other funding issues within the county, and the school district has picked up the maintenance of, the, of that, those six spots since then. One of the current crossings is funded through the city of Battlefield, and the city of Battlefield continues to fund that particular crossing. When school crossing guards in the city do not show up for their post, or they call in sick, one of the city's three non-sworn traffic safety officers have been working to replace that, that individual as much as possible. If a traffic safety officer cannot be there, then the school is called and in some situations, the school attempts to send personnel down there to, to manage that crossing. There's a similar process used for the county crossing guards as for the city, but those are managed through the school police office. Again, there are 27 city and six uh, county crossing, excuse me, seven uh, county crossings. 14 of those 34 are either connected to or on the edge of a district property. 20 of the locations are not connected directly to a district property. Of those 20, four are less than two blocks away and 16 or two or more of them or two or more blocks away. Of the seven county locations, all seven of those are connected or at the very edge of the property. There are improvements needed in the current process. The biggest issue obviously is when those, those particular crossings cannot be manned if a individual calls in sick or is unable to meet their post, that process is very difficult to manage at this point, both really at the city and the county level. Uh, absentee rate is not extremely high when you look at the number of crossings, but it does range around 10% or 475 morning and afternoon shifts over the course of a school year. 
At this point, when this PowerPoint was, was completed, we'd had 65 cancellations, uh, 48 of those at two locations in which we've had difficulty, or which the city's had difficulty, hiring individuals. Now, the 65 cancellations does not mean that that was not covered 65 times. In the vast majority of them, the TSO was able to make those coverages. And then, of course, if they fail to, to reach their absent time demand or simply do not show, then the crossing is not covered. That's always a possibility. One of the issues that we're dealing with in the current process is the appropriate use of resources. And we maintain city police, school police, and traffic safety officers meeting their primary roles and responsibilities, uh, which are much vast than just the typical crossing. And so that's part of the issue we're dealing with and the reason for this collaboration and conversation as well. The City Council and the School District met November 19th, 2013 in a joint session. At that, the county was actually at that particular meeting as well, in which we discussed the possibility of looking at a third party entity that might come in and oversee uh, the crossings. And we, we agreed at that point to um, going to a, a, a group committee to look at a possible RFP at different organizations that may offer this service. There was an RFP written. Uh, there were five organizations that met the standards of the RFP that were reviewed, and there were three that came back in for a presentation. Of those five, there has been one that has been selected among that group. So at this point, we've kind of reached a next step, and the next step is for the city. They have invited us to attend a joint meeting to discuss moving forward and what will moving forward even mean. The specific date and time has not been established. However, we did today receive five options that the city has given us for looking at your availability as well as to match some availability for their and their council. So that process is beginning. I think that Ms. Luton has those list of dates and will be sharing those with you or has already shared those with you um, this evening. So I know that's very brief and a lot of that information you have received in, in sporadic times uh, over the last few months. That kind of puts everything into a concise nutshell of where we are at this point and what those next steps may be, uh, which would be this joint meeting. I'd be glad to answer any specific questions. Any questions? Oh, Mrs. Callan? So you said of the... 65 um, cancellations, 48 were due to two locations. So like we, we've had a difficulty, there's been difficulty hiring at two locations. 70 and 75%. Yes. Thus far this year, yes. And then the other thing I just wanted to uh, clarify is that RFP was sent out by the city, right? So it wasn't our purchasing. That is correct. Okay, so they, they took responsibility for sending out the RFP and handling that through their purchasing department? That is correct. And our response to that seems to be yeah, Honestly, I was surprised that there were five different organizations that met this type of, of uh, service. And, and all five had, had, had very strong um, uh, I can't think of word. Well, references the processes in place to meet this needs. I couldn't get my mind to work. I apologize. Um, and then I guess the only other thing then I would say is that's encouraging to me because I think when we started these discussions maybe a year or so ago, maybe even longer ago, I'm not sure we ever really even considered that a third party management might be a, a good option. So that's encouraging to me. Other questions? Mr. Lee? For the county, the, the seven county, we're doing the hiring and the training for that. Prior to when this county did it, did we do the training or did they do the training? We have traditionally handled the training and the hiring. They have reimbursed the district for those costs. So we've done the training and the yes, hiring sir. and everything for the county before that? Okay. Yes, so. sir. And that's been handled through our school police office. Any other questions? I have one question, Dr. Harrell. On yes. the school crossing guard uh, location, staff twice each day for one hour in the morning and a half hour in the afternoon. Uh, I mean, I can make some 
assumptions why one hour in the morning and half hour in the afternoon but can you talk about that a little bit more why only half hour in the afternoon and if that's how it was um, is, is that was that the request on the RFP uh, that the city sent out for just an hour in the morning and a half hour in the afternoon uh, the RFP would have been designed around the current processes and those are the current processes I don't know that I could give you honestly an answer as to why um, I my answer would be I do not know that's that's been the the situation for the time that we've had the crossing guards and so the specific is why it's less in the afternoon I don't know the reasoning behind that I apologize that, that was a decision made by the city whenever they um, started this this program it would be my assumption made by the uh, the school crossing protection committee yes mr. Lee who represents the district on that school protection school uh, crossing guard the director of school police, uh, Officer Tom Tucker. He's the only one on it from this district. I believe he's the only one on the district. I believe Officer Tucker's here. I'll ask him right, right quick. Yes, uh, and Officer Hickey also needs to come and uh, find and take care of the county guard. She also indicated that Officer Hickey also attended the meeting. Uh, Mrs. Bush. Currently, it's, uh, it started as usual with the police being in charge, and, the, and we're hired, we've hired and are currently operating like we did last year. So if this is decided, um, it would change this year as soon as a contract's decided, and then there has to be some kind of a transition from the way it's done now to the way it will be done. That is exactly right. We began this school year with the same process as we have been using in the past. Uh, with the RFP that went out, assuming that the organization that, that kind of rose to the top is a select organization and a contract is, is agreed upon, then they would take over those duties at a transitional time that would be set in that contract, but it would happen this school year. And, and of our two problematic locations, are they either one uh, related to the 16 crossing zones that are two or more blocks away from the school or do you know the one uh, would be at two blocks I'm not for sure on the other one if that is specifically about the distance from it dr. Frederick and, and if someone does not show up for that duty and maybe d they do not let someone know in time because they have an emergency or urgent situation so what does that look like for a building principal when they receive notice that no one's able to cover that crossing walk so so can you kind of paint a picture for us of what that looks like for a building well it really is all about timing um, obviously there are expectations set for those individuals who are hired as as crossing guards and for the most part those are met so there's a time when they need to have that information into uh, city police so the city police can see whether or not they can cover it as soon as, they, as, soon as, as soon as city police discovers they cannot cover it, they send an email to that building principal. So assuming that the building principal is at their desk and receive that email, then at that point they'll try to react to it if at all possible. So it's really all about timing. Um, it can be a little bit chaotic though, obviously. Uh, you've got, you're starting school, you're getting things situated, you have other duties that you're doing, and then now you've got to try to find someone or you yourself uh, go out and assist with covering that crosswalk so that, that absolutely can be problematic and then how would that look different with the um, implementation of a third party uh, that would provide that service with a third party vendor uh, with this particular vendor they've assured us coverage not only for the crossing guard itself who's a, himself or herself who's assigned to that post but also a series of substitutes and they have many options uh, to where they could get a sub there. Now, in an emergency situation or something happened at a very short amount of time, it could be that a crossing substitute arrives later than what we would have them, but they will get there. And that's sometimes a situation we're dealing with even right now uh, in that we'll have an individual who gets there, but they may be 5 to 15 minutes later than what we prefer them to be there. This may not solve that problem. I believe this would solve the problem because these individuals, there, there's a variety of subs, and these subs are already out at other 
um, they have other duties assigned with that particular organization. So I believe that we'd be much better off. Thank you. Anyone, any other questions? I don't mean to take all the time. Okay. Thank you very much. She has dates that she will get to the everybody to okay. get their yeah, back. Yes. I understand that this is the five option dates that Ms. Loon is handing out to us. And Dr. Jungman, do you know, will we be meeting with city representatives or city council or who will that meeting My be involved? My understanding would be joint council and board invitation. So I, everybody that could make it at that point. All of these are in September, so we're hoping that we can get that moved quickly. But give us your feedback on the dates and we'll get that back to them and try to get a date and time set that's convenient for the most. Okay. Thank you. So would you, let's see, Mrs. Lou, you better give us a deadline. When do you want this back? <laughs> we need, they still need to pull the council also. So as soon as I could get, if I could get them back by end of day tomorrow, is that? Can, if you put this in doodle, it makes it a lot easier to. I, I just got these late this afternoon, so okay. we thought we'd give it a shot here. So in, end of day, Wednesday, September 3rd, so what you would like? Yeah, before five o'clock. Yep. Okay. <laughs> okay. We'll move on to preliminary contracts, agreements, and change orders. Uh, item four. Uh, these items will be presented to the Board of Education at the upcoming regular meeting under consent agenda and are provided for our preparatory information. So at that meeting, the Board of Education members may remove any item from consent for separate discussion and consideration. And the documents posted um, are posted to support any agreements exceeding the $75,000 total. Um, so, Mrs. Emery? Thank you, Dr. Frederick. I'd just like to point out that we do have one agreement that is listed for which we do not currently have comprehensive information, but we wanted you to know that it is forthcoming and that is something that Mr. McKenna and I have partnered together on and it has to do with our, um, our uh, stop loss insurance. So we did provide you with the rate from last year. I would also like to point out that for future agendas, we will also post the name of the cabinet member for whom you may reach out and call if you do have questions. So we will include that uh, behind the title. So we've listed them in order of highest to lowest, and uh, each of these will appear at the September 16th meeting. Are there any questions at this time? Question? I, I have one quick question. Sure. So, I'm just full of questions tonight, but uh, just to to help as as we move forward in thinking with this, with the health plan third party administrator, so I'll invite Mr. McKenna. It's just the the terminology implementation of disease management programs. Um, I think I'm just thinking how will that look different from what we already have in place with our wellness coordinator and our wellness programs um, you know so how would that disease management program look differently than what we try to provide employees now our wellness initiatives at the district level are really focused on prevention and helping employees to have a level of accountability for their own health care and getting them engaged with their coworkers and with the health plan around those types of initiatives. Disease management really refers to the, the aggregation of data, primarily claims, health plan claims data, that would help us to predict when someone is uh, headed down a road that could ultimately end in a disease. Um, so, for example, if you have all of the, the warning signs of heart disease, high blood pressure, high stress, if you're a smoker, those kinds of things, the health plan uh, disease management can aggregate that data through the claims administration process and then flag us. And then the disease management team can then reach out to those people and, and encourage them to take part in preventative measures which would mitigate the long-term effects of heart disease in my example. And that's a step, a layer of service that we aren't currently engaged in as a health plan. And the increase, which is a significant 
increase. Would that be personnel required to do that or software or program or, or is that just something that's part of the services that come with the administrator that maybe it's something you can't answer? I don't know. Well, it is, it's all managed through a third party because uh, it involves nurses, it involves personnel costs. Someone has to not only aggregate all the data, the sort of the data and analytics component, but then also has to have a medical background so that when they look at the results of that data, they can actually reach out to the, the participant and have a conversation with them about their health care. Um, so all of that adds up to, to the costs associated that you see there. Most of it is personnel um, targeted nurses, those kinds of things, and uh, technology. Okay. Any other questions? Just to clarify, we're not, you're not going to get that medical information. The TPA is going to get that. A while ago you said then we will, but just to clarify, yeah. that's still private information between the provider and the client. Absolutely. Correct. Ms. Um, on the Wonders of Wildlife um, Facilities Use Agreement, so really our, our commitment to that fiscally is um, just maintaining the maintenance, upkeep, and repair of all facilities and furnishings. That is correct. So Very minimal for the benefit for our kids. And I guess I just point that out to show the general yes. On to uh, 5.01, board policy, adoptions, revisions. Uh, board policy first reading will come to study session. So we have it tonight. Board members will have two weeks to contact administration with questions or comments. So a vote will be taken at the second reading, which will be held at our upcoming regular session, September 16. Am I correct on that, Dr. Jungman? A little bit different than we've seen in the past, but still very appropriate and a good way to do this. If you have questions, come forward that require additional time for uh, research. Uh, a second reading can be put off until the next month's regular meeting in October. So this is how we'll now do our first reading at study session, second reading, regular session vote, unless we need additional information. Uh, so we have Board Policy BBFA with explanation and updates. Do this policy, uh, just like most policies, are just revisions. As since we went with the MSBA policy contract, this one deals with you actually. So uh, <laughs> it's odd that you get one that's actually about you. So this is board member conflict of interest, financial disclosure, and it does represent uh, a significant change from past uh, around your disclosure and your process. It used to be you could just file. Uh, this every two years and you would not have to actually fill out a short form this actually uh, changes that recommendation by MSBA to annually filling out the short form uh, so we will ask you to participate in that next year and every year thereafter if we pass this policy as presented so no voting tonight you can read the other modifications there was a little bit of a Senate bill I think it was 719 provided some additional guidance so uh, take a review of that, give us any questions you have, and we'll proceed. Okay. Any question? This Ms. Ms. Cowan? talks about um, gifts. Um, is gifts ever defined anywhere? It is not. They, they really don't give that uh, a definition. So because occasionally we'll be taken out for dinner right. um, or something like that, and I guess it would be helpful for me to know okay. if that's something yeah. we should be disclosing. Exactly. Think it does put a value on it, a dollar amount in the policy, actually a hundred dollars. So dinner falls. I've never been to that dinner, but I'm sure they exist. If, if there are meetings and there's a dinner, a part of it, I think this okay. allows that that would be a. a I just want to make sure so. because I think that's the only thing that. Yeah, I've that the board's heard. participated in. Very good. Okay, thank you. Moving on to six. Uh, point o, which you'll know we have a new title for this new business uh, and we have no new items for consideration this evening so no new business um, yes so does that mean how will the items that we're voting on on the 16th how will that information come to us 
if they're new, if they're items that would be in the contracts, uh, those kind of things will come consent like they normally do, right? So they came in 4.01 as a group, and now they'll instead of having separate item by item by item, kind of like we used to have some of those easements and those things, we've collectively grouped them, and now they'll shift to consent just like they would have. There was like a curriculum. There's a curriculum. We would have it new business tonight. So that would be there. Okay. Right. It would be right there tonight. And then it would come back to us as unfinished business for vote at the regular meeting. So still as a current item, it would just move from presented the first time to presented the second time. Mm -hmm. Policy we're going to keep as a separate chunk so we don't put it in new business or unfinished business. Policy will be there every month uh, as a separate uh, work item for us to look at. And then new business, old business will depend on the month and what we have coming our way. OSRs. Typically, will be as information and reports. We have combined tonight's OSR with the APR just because they go hand in hand at the bottom because they uh, are all about the same thing. So. Thank you. Very good. Any other questions about new business? Very good. We'll move on to 7.01. We have at this time no items for consideration under unfinished business. And now we'll move to public comments to address um, non agenda items. Just as a reminder, uh, this is a point in time where the Board of Education allows comments on topics not related to the printed agenda, but the comments at this point are limited to three minutes for each speaker and will be timed by Mrs. Luton. So it is inappropriate to address the Board about individual students or individual staff members by name in an open meeting. So if you have concerns, again, about individuals, these concerns should be addressed through appropriate administrative supervisors, either at the school or in the district office. So, Mrs. Luton, do we have um, comments to address non-agenda items this evening? Okay, we do not. Thank you. So we'll move to the strategic discussion. You'll notice we've kind of rearranged that. Um, at this point in time, we will uh, take time to have our, our strategic discussion. Um, I'm going to do this uh, order just slightly different. We're going, going to start with 9.03 follow-up from 716 uh, and allow Mr. Hosmer time to join us, uh, which he should be here shortly. So we'll start with 9.03 follow-up from 716 Board of Education retreat. Dr. Jungley. Very good. Those of you who are last meeting know that we spent a little bit of time reviewing the document that's posted and offering some edits and some ideas as we kind of collaborated around our norms, our roles, our responsibilities, administrative communication standards, board communication standards. Uh, I was able to take that feedback, work with cabinet, and make some minor modifications. You'll see a couple things pulled off of the responsibilities, new section on courtesy communication uh, when it comes to administration and how you work with cabinet. Uh, the media communication basically stayed the same, <laughs> updated a couple other items, but based all upon your feedback. So at this point, uh, my expectation is that unless you have any ideas for changes or feedback, this will just kind of become our practice. I don't think this is something that we need vote. We don't need approval. This is just a board set of expectations and that you will hold yourselves accountable for. and. The, the cabinet will hold ourselves accountable for as we work uh, in partnership to serve our students. Uh, so this is your opportunity. Any feedback, any questions, any concerns, any last minute edits before we proceed? And I would expect this something, this to be something that we would review annually at one of our retreats. You know, we've talked about quarterly, maybe chunking those up around different ideas. This is something that I hope we'd just take a peek at annually. Also can become a part of board training and orientation processes as we bring new board members on over the years. So, any feedback? Yes. Chris. Uh, Mrs. Kelly. Uh, I would just say instead of pulling it out once a year, I think there's some value in um, pulling out. I know that for a while we've had little kind of like cheat sheets up yeah. at the um, podium or uh, at our seats that, you know, kind of like I think particularly the norms, like what we, how we agreed to do our work together. I think that's just a helpful reminder sometimes when you're up there in the heat of the moment. Um, so I, I think there'd be some value in, in having it be a, a more um, in front of us and, and something that we refer to versus just knowing that it's there. Right. So I, I think there's some value there. We'll definitely post it in board docs, but you know some of the things that we've done in the past is a little laminate, laminated card that kind of sits at your table, so when you're there, kind of reminds you of what's my role, what's my responsibility, what have we agreed to. Maybe those first 
three kind of sections might become that uh, part and go from there. And then maybe uh, review could be kind of part of your plus delta conversation at the end of the meeting. How do we do on our norms tonight or responsibilities? So it could be a question we pose to keep us thinking about it. I think it's an excellent document. I think you represented it pretty thorough and pretty well represented. I like it. Good foundation to build upon as we do our work together, I think. Yeah. so. Following that up, I would say that as we think back to retreat, uh, last month we did a little conversation about mm -hmm. our, what do we think are the right measures? Uh, and we kind of did a little brainstorming around those and uh, teamed up and I gave you a little feedback of what the uh, listening and learning tours had told us so far. We're far from done. You know, we've got another 30 days of that and data coming in a lot, so we'll continue to share that back out. So that was just to kind of prime the pump for the conversations that will be coming later, and also they'll be very relevant tonight as we talk about APR, talk about the measures that are represented there, and are they the measures that we believe in, and how do we uh, strive after those if they are. Uh, but the second part of retreat, and we didn't talk about this last time, was that we kind of put on hold was board goals. You know, if we got to the end of that meeting and we had kind of had a set that was posted on the website at one point, but we had, you had given me feedback that you had done some additional work at a previous retreat the year before, so I was able to find that information, and I'm going to pass that out to you tonight. It's a one sheet, one goal with some different measures, some different strategies, some different ideas. Uh, unfortunately, that had kind of sat, I think, for a year as you went through the transition of search for superintendent and those kind of things, took the board's time. Uh, now I think it's time to refresh and say, is this where we want to be right now? Uh, now that we have a uh, kind of new leadership and a new set of norms and responsibilities, is this where we want to spend our time? So I'm going to give you that handout, basically, that lists those things and just ask you to go home and kind of reflect on that, a little homework, sorry, uh, yeah, and okay. think about it as we come back for next study session to think about, are these the appropriate goals for the board to be working on this year? Do you want to start from scratch and developing, uh, or do you want to take these and just tweak and modify and then go from there so that we, I can help direct that work uh, and give you what you need in order to grow as board members? So I'll pass that out. Uh, it's really just for reflection tonight, and then we can proceed and put it on the agenda for next month. Yeah. And we'll send it out electronically too, but sometimes you, I know it's good to have one in your hand. you want us to just take some time look over and we'll come back at our next study session yeah I know kind of I, I know Tim wasn't even a part of that conversation at that point and Kenny, I think you had just joined the board at that point so I know it's been a year probably since you've even seen it so take it back reflect think about it and think about the time that's trans you know, transpired since then is this where we want to be so as we come back next study session in October we can have a conversation about reset use these proceed Any questions or comments that you see? It? Do you want a, a couple minutes, a minute here to look over? Okay. Can I just clarify? Um, and I think this is a question to um, Mrs. Bush and Mr. Lee, but uh, weren't you the board members that were kind of charged with working with Mrs. Palmer to develop yes. those, those yes. measures? Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're going to work up on from 9.03 up to 9.02, Amendment 3, Missouri Teacher Performance Evaluation. The administration will present information for a board review and discussion on Amendment 3. Additional information and slides will be posted, uh, were posted uh, today prior to the board meeting for the board's review. Thank you, uh, and good evening. It's um, always a pleasure to have the opportunity to, to talk with uh, the board, and uh, I wish that this was a particular topic we weren't having to address tonight, but it is important to give you a little bit of uh, perspective both on the content of Amendment 3 um, and then also 
the potential consequences of Amendment 3 should it become a part of our Constitution after um, November's ballot initiative. So I want to walk through that uh, with you briefly in this presentation uh, just to kind of spark your discussion and encourage you to, to prompt some thought as we, um, as we move through. So uh, first, uh, just a by its very nature, this is a constitutional amendment, and that is a specific, uh, important part of this idea. Uh, the fact that the Constitution is the selected vehicle uh, through which this uh, change was proposed. Uh, in Missouri, the Constitution can only be amended in three ways, and I've listed those for you on the screen. Uh, first of all, um, a majority vote of both the House and the Senate can then send the item to voters to uh, become a part of the Constitution, which would require that both houses um, agree, which is a, a very difficult thing, as you can imagine, to happen. Uh, next, an initiative petition. So um, this is the vehicle that was used in this particular uh, petition. It's a very complex uh, requirement based on the population of different congressional districts, um, the number of petitions that are required. And in this case, over 317,000 signatures were submitted um, by the uh, individuals and the, the organizations supporting Amendment 3 to get that on the ballot. So in order for a similar change to occur, a similar amount of, of groundswell and, uh, and field work would have to occur to get those petitions submitted. Uh, and then lastly, a constitutional convention, which is just a gathering of legislators to change the Constitution, happens every 20 years, or can happen as often as every 20 years. So again, um, three, three possibilities here uh, from a legal perspective, but really um, the only practical one is the initiative, um, and that requires a significant amount of, of money and time to produce. So um, right away we can see that if a constitutional amendment occurs, it is something that is intended to be long-lasting and um, have long-lasting effects and impact. So uh, if this particular constitutional amendment uh, passed, we could expect a similar uh, impact on, on public education and students given the, the difficulty in potentially making a change in the future. Components of the amendment, this is uh, sort of what is the amendment, what does it do? Uh, first of all, it applies to all staff holding a certificate to teach. And that's significant because in Springfield, in a district the size of Springfield that provides the scope of services that we do, we have lots of staff members that have certificates to teach that are not directly interacting with students on a daily basis. Uh, we ran some quick numbers, and in Springfield we have approximately 350 employees that hold certificates to teach but do not actually interact with students. So think our Title I coaches, professional learning specialists, curriculum development specialists. Those people would be subject to the provisions of, these, of this amendment if, uh, if it were to pass. And you'll see kind of the challenges associated with that in a moment. Uh, it requires or it would make all staff that um, are hired after the effective date of the amendment at will employees, meaning that they can come to work if they choose every day at their own will and the school district continues to employ them at their will. There's no contractual arrangement or relationship between the parties. And it re requires the adoption of a performance evaluation system that is both approved by DESE and the majority of which is based on quantifiable student performance data based on objective criteria. So again, if we take those one at a time, we know that if, it, if it's going to be approved by the state, that is uh, control that is then housed outside of the local Board of Education. It's housed at the state level. We don't know exactly how the state would go about approving those changes or what requirements would be in place, but we know for sure that local Boards of Education would not have that control. Uh, the majority of the system, as I mentioned, has to be based on quantifiable student performance data. Um, a number of challenges there, the most uh, blatant of which is that in this particular component or piece of legislation, quantifiable student performance data is not defined. Um, we can make some assumptions based on what we know about standardized testing, and we'll talk more about that in just a moment. Um, but the majority of that evaluation would be based on this sort of question mark around student achievement and student data. Um, it's important to note that as we've talked about before, the state is currently undergoing evaluation, performance evaluation reform um, statewide, and Springfield is, is taking part in that evaluation reform as well. And DESE has seven essential principles that we've also talked about. One of those principles is that a substantial portion of the evaluation must be based in student achievement data. 
Uh, so the, the use of student achievement data is not a new idea. It's the idea that that one word makes a big difference, a substantial component versus a majority component. And it certainly isn't that we are afraid of including the results of teacher work and student achievement in the evaluation process, but it has to be done in a way that makes sense locally and be done in a way that includes multiple measures over time as opposed to, um, you know, again, this sort of question mark around the majority of the evaluation score. It requires uh, the results to be used to make employment decisions, determine compensation levels, and select staff if a reduction in force uh, were to be um, to undertaken by the school district. The first bullet is not new. We, um, we use um, the current data from our evaluation system to make employment decisions today when we talk about the renewal or non-renewal of probationary teaching contracts. The second and third bullets would be new. Uh, the compensation system or the salary schedule has to be tied to the results of this evaluation system, and uh, there would be a price tag associated with that, which is unknown at this point. The third bullet, um, in the event that we do have to reduce our workforce or re reduce our teaching population, this data would be used to make those decisions, um, and again, that's, that's new as well. Um, the, last com the, the last bullet that we listed here for you is that uh, sort of a nuance in the change around the reasons that probationary or tenured teaching contracts can be terminated. Currently our state statutes outline uh, quite a bit of information around the process that's used to terminate teaching contracts and the reasons that a contract can be terminated. Um, there are seven reasons under state statute that, that are allowed. All seven of those are repeated in this constitutional amendment with the exception of one, which is the willful or persistent violation of policies of the Board of Education. So presumably, um, a school district could terminate a tenured teacher contract or a probationary teacher contract for six reasons, but not if they persistently violate um, the Board of Education policy. So what does all of this uh, mean? Uh, what would the potential likely outcomes be? And of course, we're guessing a little bit here, looking into the crystal ball to try to make that determination. But uh, we do know for sure that a loss of local control is one of the outcomes. Uh, again, DESE approval required for evaluation instruments. That would uh, be a current process that is approved by the local Board of Education that would be removed from their control. Um, quantifiable student performance measures is not defined. We kind of touched on that already. Um, well, in the next bullet here, the next section, an increase in standardized testing, we'll, we'll dive a little bit deeper into that. And at the start of the presentation, I covered for you that the Constitution does not allow flexibility that would be needed by boards of education to respond to changing needs of students and changing uh, needs of teachers and, and the changing sort of landscape of education. Um, Again, we can't wait 20 years for a constitutional convention or rely on getting over 300,000 signatures to get a change on the ballot if we need to make a change in the future. The increase in standardized testing, um, again, uh, if, if a majority of the evaluation components will be based on student achievement, we can assume that in Missouri, school districts will rely more heavily on standardized testing. And we also know that, as I mentioned before, the most effective use of that data it requires multiple data points over time from multiple different sources, which means that school districts are going to need to employ more testing in order to get more, more data points, which has a price tag associated with it as well. Uh, when you think about the nuances or the, the sort of the differentiation for teachers in specialty roles, specifically art, music, PE, those kinds of things, uh, we know that measuring performance and student achievement in those areas is different than it is in traditional core classrooms. That is a conversation that continues to happen nationally and in the state as, as we do our, as we undergo evaluation reform that I already, I already mentioned to you. Uh, we have to sort of tackle that question of how do you differentiate the strategy for teachers that are not in core classroom settings. Uh, that's not set out in this amendment and it's a, it's a question mark. We don't know how that would look or what it, or how it could be differentiated for teachers in those specialty areas. Increased litigation uh, is a pretty certain outcome uh, if this uh, initiative were to, to pass. Um, if we're basing compensation, employment, and reductions in force on this instrument and the process associated with it, we can bet that we're going to end up in court to try to answer some of these unanswered questions that I've covered with you already this evening. Um, also, the reliability and the validity of student testing, if we are, again, putting so much emphasis on this, so many stakes behind uh, the use of student achievement and standardized testing, 
Uh, we're certain to be questioned on that at some point in the future when we base employment decisions um, on it. We, we will be questioned on those people that may be adversely impacted by those decisions to determine the reliability of that testing. And everything has a price tag, as I mentioned. So uh, as we as we navigate those legal waters, we'll have attorney's fees. School districts will face attorney's fees um, to, to answer those questions. The cost administratively of um, testing, performance evaluation, instrument development, implementation of changes. And then lastly, uh, just the most obvious costs, if we tie our compensation instruments to performance evaluation and we differentiate the compensation based on the level of performance that the employee provides, that will also have a price tag. And certainly, um, we all have different viewpoints on pay for performance and whether or not that's appropriate in education. Uh, that really is not the focus of this issue. The focus of this issue is, is the Constitution the appropriate vehicle through which this type of change should occur? And if it is, um, should it occur in December? Because we've been talking about evaluation reform in Missouri for over three years now. It's a very significant implementation, significant undertaking, and when we make this type of sweeping change, we need the time associated um, to, to uh, absorb that. So those are some of the likely outcomes that came about um, as we had this conversation. I think um, usually we hear the most uh, useful information from those closest to the action, and so um, to provide us that perspective, I've asked Kitty Lou Maxson, the president of the Springfield NEA, to uh, provide us sort of the perspective of the NEA and the teachers that she talks with and represents every day. So, Kitty Lou. Good evening, Madam President, board members, members of the cabinet. When you ask any educator if they consider their profession to be a business or an art, they would lean heavily toward it being an art but any educator also willingly understands the need for accountability as they provide an undeniably important service to their community through the work with their students each day. I think you're all familiar with the nonprofit Teach Great. I'd be remiss if I didn't take this opportunity to tell you that that's grammatically an incorrect phrase. I teach well, not great. <laughs> um, but putting all politics aside, you've asked me to bring the teacher perspective. Thank you for this opportunity. I also, as Parker has, looked into the crystal ball to bring you these possible scenarios. <clears throat> Let's start by looking at our very own Springfield learning model. Its processes include the three C's, critical thinking, collaboration, and communication. Should Amendment 3 pass, teachers could see a much different emphasis than these areas. With so much riding on a one-size-fits-all state-mandated testing, state mandated testing the results of which become the quantifiable student performance data to be used as the majority of each educator's professional evaluation, our new three C's might sound something like this. Careful test taking, communicating quantifiable data, competition. Let's look at this last one, competition. Our district currently fosters and supports a culture of team collaboration at all levels. Amendment three could cause a subtle yet negative shift toward professional isolation and competition among colleagues. Both are antithetical to the professional development of educators and are not in the best interests of our students who come to us each year with a wide variety of strengths and needs. PD would need to focus on teaching to the tests. Teachers believe that what our district is focusing on now, the growth and progress of our students over time, is so much more relevant and accurate than any single status shot derived from a one-size-fits-all high-stakes testing event. As a climate of harmful competitiveness, com competitiveness grew, the very same educators who now choose to follow their hearts and heads into careers where they advocate for the students with the most challenges to overcome, like many in our title and focus schools, these educators would be faced with the reality of their very jobs being on the line if their students' scores didn't meet certain state-mandated levels. Imagine the scenario that could quickly emerge. Students with potentially the most to lose would no longer have the advantages of being guided and taught by our most experienced educators. What teacher would be willing to continue to take that risk? I wonder if you've thought about the extra burden that will be placed on administrators and counselors if this amendment becomes law. As they create class lists and schedules, they will now not only be trying to match their students' needs with their teachers' strengths, but also be deciding the makeup of the group by which their colleagues will be evaluated and compensated. What a strain this will put on the professional and collegial rel relationships of educators at each site, but also on the student-teacher relationship. Beyond the shift to careful test-taking and competition, it seems our mission statement might change to from learning is personal to something more like learning is quantifiable. 
Understand, educators want to show the effects of their art and professionalism through an effective evaluation system, which Parker's always already talked to us about. Teachers do not shy away from this process. Our district is currently implementing a new educator evaluation system, which relies on highly trained administrators collaborating with educators to use multiple measures over time in order to rate educator effectiveness. This evaluation process, when paired with, an, with our negotiated binding contract and existing board policy, allows the district to have both the input and the control it needs to ensure a quality educational environment for each student. I never thought I'd be so pleased to have the Springfield Learning Model to rely on as a structure. But as we move forward together in transparency and accountability, we must think critically about how we communicate this important issue and continue to foster collaborative, person-centered relationships which together benefit our students, educators, and our whole community. Teachers aren't interested in having a constitutional amendment insert itself into our district's continually improving processes. Teachers and students are more than test scores. Teachers understand that there will be high costs of implementation, draining funding away from what they know their classrooms actually need. Teachers don't believe their students deserve this extra testing burden. Teachers value working in a district that has high levels of local control. This is a teacher's perspective. Thank you. Thank you, Katie Lou. And by the way, I know she just got off the road from Jefferson City uh, doing more work up at the state capitol, and she walked right into our meeting. So uh, thank you for taking the time to, to uh, prepare and, and deliver those remarks. So outstanding questions. Um, these are the, the questions that remain, and, and again, with an, eff an effort uh, to try to spawn your conversation and discussion tonight. How will certificated staff that don't directly interact with students be affected? That's that 330 number that I gave you at the start of the presentation. Um, how would DESE approve evaluation instruments? How will local boards of education maintain flexibility to respond to the changing needs of students, given the inflexible nature of constitutional amendments? How would boards fund the costs associated with the, all of the items that we've discussed? Um, how would conflicts between state statutes and the, com the constitutional amendment be resolved? Um, and there are some conflicting um, p points between our Missouri state statute and this proposed amendment. And how would the performance of specialty teachers be monitored? But probably most of all, we'll use the guiding question that we use for everything else, is this good for students? And I can tell you just based on the number of questions that we have and the perspectives that we've heard, I think you've got a good basis for your discussion on that, on that point. So what can be done? Uh, boards of ed education can make public appearances, generate press releases, develop or approve resolutions outlining official positions on a ballot initiative like this one. Uh, what you can't do um, outside of those exceptions is to use district resources, uh, and I've listed some examples for you there, to, to support or to oppose the issue. And that's a very specific portion of state statute that prohibits the use of public funds in those areas. So we want to be careful uh, to be appropriate and to be careful as we move forward um, with, with those next steps. And speaking of next steps, uh, in addition to your discussion tonight, um, we're happy to, to try to answer any questions that you have, but then also uh, we'd like some guidance from the board about uh, what you'd like us to do or how we, you'd like us to support you in your next steps. Um, certainly a, a possible resolution is on the table uh, outlining the board's position, but again, um, that would be the result of your conversation. And if you have any questions, we're happy to try to answer those. Questions, questions, comments, or for discussion, questions, comments. Who would like to start? How do you like that opening? <laughs> Mr. Hosmer, thank you for joining us. Oh, you're welcome. I apologize for being late. I guess my thought on this amendment has been the same the whole time, which is I don't know anybody in education that thinks this is a good idea. I, I'm still looking for somebody to say, Missouri School Board, I mean, a, a, a legitimate group of educators that says, you know, folks, this is what we need to do. What I do know is that the same St. Louis billionaire that has been wrong on every public education issue up to date is the primary backer of this. So if you follow the money, it seems like this is another attempt uh, to wrest control of education decisions from local boards of education. So again, if I had a bunch of legitimate school associations or teachers or 
administrators or school boards saying, you know, we need to make these changes, I'd certainly want to consider it. But I got nobody saying that I've heard saying this is a this is going to improve education in the state of Missouri. So I certainly am, am in favor of, of drafting a resolution um, uh, opposing uh, this amendment and doing what we can to, to defeat it. Just in general, I'm against any constitutional amendment that's done through initiatives, whether I'm for the issue or not. I just think it's a horrible way to um, develop public policy in a state where we represent uh, or where we elect people to re represent us and to make those kinds of decisions. So um, with, with that uh, stance aside, uh, the one, there's a lot of issues that concern me, but you know, I know that this is coming from what we would consider a very conservative um, element in our state politically. And I just cannot believe, and um, I appreciate this being brought out, that um, we as an employer would not have the power to fire an employee who willfully or persistently violates our, our organizational policies. And I don't think there would be any um, person that runs a business, <laughs> conservative, liberal, or anywhere in between, that would think that an employer doesn't have the right to, um, you know, fire an employee who violates their organizational policies. So I think that that, um, in and of itself, is um, something. You know, since I've been on the board, you know. Fortunately, we have not had that many uh, issues come up with staff that we've had to um, uh, go through um, the, the termination process, but we have. Um, I've never felt as a board member that my hands are tied with the current um, policy. I think our teacher organizations have supported us when it's been identified that um, an individual is, is not um, appropriately um, um, position to to teach in our school system or to work for us so um, and some of those have been because that person has willfully or persistently violated our policy so um, I would strongly su um, suggest that we um, adopt and, and support a, um, a resolution against amendment three start but uh, I don't want to repeat anything I would totally support a resolution in opposition as Mr. Hosmer said I haven't heard anybody other than the guy who wrote it supportive of it from the teachers and what it's going to do for kids I, I, I too constitutional amendment is not the way to run a country you just don't put personnel decisions in the Constitution um, in, whether you agree with the principles or not in it, it doesn't make a difference. You just don't do it that way. And I, you know, I, to me, I'm a big believer of teacher evaluations and performance evaluations for all of our employees. But it's got to be a tool. It's got to be a tool for improvement, not a tool for punishment. And and that's what we're really getting into is is no longer a tool for us to be able to use. It's putting it in black and white. This is the way it's going to be irrespective of consequences, irrespective of situations, irrespective of whatever uh, things are out there. Um, and just local control, I, I mean, that's just absurd to be able to take away local control out of the hands of the local board who is elected by the people uh, to do that. Um, one question I haven't heard, because as uh, Parker talked about, I think there's going to be an incredible amount of unintended costs whether it's more standardized testing or whatever, has been any discussion about Hancock Amendment with respect to additional costs that will be burden upon districts to do this? Um, because on one hand, you know, they've complained about the MAP scores all along, which they're not, I mean, they're useless anyway, but to do standardized test, I'm not standardized, to do performance evaluations with standardized tests, you've got to have multiple test points. You can't do that one time, which is totally contrary to what they've been pushing 
to support map tests that it's not good, and it's not, but we can't, they can't, that's what they're pushing to get. I mean, I, I have never figured out, they're arguing about what they fought <laughs> for many years with the standardized map testing um, and how we get to the other side. So I, I don't know, I just, somewhere along the lines, there's got to be some real fiscal, let alone how bad it is for kids and how bad it is for the community and parents and teachers and everybody else. Some kind of fiscal note of what it's going to do to, and nobody's talked about it. Nobody talks about that. Nobody addresses the cost, unintended cost of this thing to be done right. And, uh, and you can't unscramble the egg here. Once it's done, you're never going to get, you can't go back. It's just not practical to go back. And so uh, whatever the spin's going to be, I mean, I can just hear the spin now from that, from that side. Um, you know, it, it's going to be up to us, to us, and I'm talking about the seven board members here, to get out and state the positions that you guys can't state to do that. And I think it's going to be really important that we have the data, the information, and, and the locations to go out and promote the defeat of this, uh, wherever that may be, and push the limit of what we can do as board members um, to fight this. Uh, I mean, we are the largest elected body in the state of Missouri, mm -hmm. school board members. We have more elected officials than anybody else in this state. If we ever decide and get our act together and get committed to do something, there's not, mu I, this is my opinion, there's not much we can do. But we got to get together, and if that means circling the wagons with other districts and whatever, I'm all for it. But um, we have no vested interest in this as a school board. I mean, we're not affected by the teacher evaluations. We're not affected by it personally other than what's good for kids, and it's not good for kids. And that's what we need to be looking at. The bottom line is what's good for kids, and this totally goes the opposite direction. So, you know, I'm totally in favor of a resolution as strongly as we can put one together and promote it and market it, whatever we have to do to get it out uh, to legislators, to the voters, to the parents, to make sure that we get this thing defeated. The only fiscal note that I've heard associated uh, doesn't necessarily deal with this amendment, but it deals with previous le pieces of legislation that were moving forward that were very or very similar. And, you know, estimates were up close to a billion dollars in assessment creation. If you think about what it would take to take the third through eighth uh, math and com arts structure and take that to every content area, every, every content area and every grade level and do it over growth over time, you know, you're talking about a massive cost and it, would it be unfunded or would it just be taken away from other funds that we now use to hire teachers and do other things in order to create assessment? It would be a shift. There wouldn't be new resources to make it happen. It would take a shift, whether that be at the local or state level. It's going to hurt the classroom environment for uh, funding for sure. We're already $600 million underfunded, so let's just add another billion to it. This is, we know why this has happened. We know that Mr. Singfield wants this to happen. It's really not a huge movement, and, and it happened because he couldn't make it happen in the legislature, so he's bypassing it. And he would say, well, it's the will of the people because 300-some people signed a petition. Well, I know up close and personal what, personally what those petition gatherers do, having them stand outside of facilities election period after election period where they actually lie to people about what the issue is. That's how we got 317,000 people there. When petition gatherers are paid by the, by the name, $2 for every name you gather, they're a little motivated to find a way to get somebody to sign a sheet. So if somebody says, well, this is just the will of the people, look at all of these people that signed, no. I would say the majority of them didn't even know what they were signing. And the legislature has tried to get it to where, in the old, in the old days, people that gathered signatures were committed to that issue. 
in most recent times when there are people with money who want to get something done, they have contracted and paid for those and paid a pretty good sum, and that's the case here. This is not the will of, of the general population. This is because somebody manipulated it, and we cannot stand to have government by voted constitutional amendment. So I, I'm very much in favor of uh, a resolution and anything we can do as individuals to get out and to tell people why this happened and why it's bad. Okay. Any other comments? And I will just kind of add to this. Um, I, like Mr. Lee said, I have so much to say about this that I can't even begin uh, to start this evening as a person who's I dedicated my life to education, public education, 16 years in the classroom and 10 in administration and three at higher ed for teacher prep programs. This is appalling to me and you will hear more from me because I plan to be very vocal about this and when I look at particularly perform, uh, quantifiable student performance measures has not been defined is just something I can't even fathom and how we would look at teacher performance without those measures of the relationship a teacher builds with his or her students, the desire that they uh, bring about with students that want to come to school to see them. I mean, there's it, the list goes on and on, and like I said, I, I'm trying to put all that, my thoughts and words together, but uh, I, as your uh, board president this year, will, will be very out there and vocal about this because my years of experience is, is my evidence that this is bad for kids and, and bad for teachers, um, which is then bad for kids. And, and so um, anyway, that's all I'll stop there for now. But what I do, ha what I do have to hand out is this is um, a resolution that has been developed by the Missouri Association of School Administrators. Is that right? MSBA. Oh, MS, this is MSBA. MSBA is I thought it was massive. Solution. Okay. Yep. This is MSBA. Okay. And so I'm going to hand this out as something as a guideline or just a kind of a starting point. Something to look at. MSBA. So our next steps, then I think uh, it is. It seems to me that we have consensus that our next steps is that we do want to develop a resolution outlining an official position on the issue of Amendment 3. Um, do you want to, uh, someone give me some idea of what, what do you want to do next? Use this as guideline, do some thinking about it. If you want to change some of the wording, send it back. I, I like the resolution that they've come up with. It's kind of brief, but I think it hits the high points. I think it would be nice to have a little bit more definition, a little bit more information on there without getting it two or three pages, but sure. in a one page. I mean, to me, this hits the highlights of what we need to address, the bullet points, so to speak, but I do need to think it needs flushed out a little bit more with a little bit more data or information if we can do that. But yeah, I was going to say, it more 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 oh, it needs to be yeah. personalized to Springfield, absolutely. I mean, could we, yeah, could we do <coughs> under each of the whereas add maybe a, a local explanation or, you know, I, I mean, I feel very strongly that if the average voter out there knew that the ability of a school district to fire an employee who willfully um, uh, violates their policy <laughs> um, would, it, is being removed from, you know, our ability. I think most people would go, what? You know, I mean, you've got to be kidding. So, I mean, I think maybe some of those kind of um, well, I mean, the, shock, shock yeah. points would be good. <laughs> what the community's hearing and what they're being told is, do you think teachers should have permanent contracts and be yeah. employed forever? That's what they're being told. <laughs> right. That is exactly what they're being told when they signed the petition? Yeah. Do you think that's right? Would you want to be in that situation? Or do you think that's fair to you since you're at, I mean, it's just so much manipulation out there and it's really imperative to us to get out with the facts of what this is and what it does. And I, I just, 
So as much information as we can get and develop and, and have at our fingertips will be, uh, whether it's pre FAQs or it's data points or it's bullet points or talking points, whatever you want to call them. And it may be tons of, it may be 10 pages worth of stuff. I don't know. I think it's really imperative for us to have that information at our fingertips because we're addressing it every day somewhere, whether it's church or it's at a school or at a PTA meeting or something, they're asking about it. Uh, we can work on, with Mr. McKenna and myself, and I could work on developing this more locally, right, taking this and blowing up uh, some personalized comments as well as some information for you based on the presentation, some talking points that you could have at your fingertips. Uh, MSBA will obviously be providing you with some additional information. I'm sure you get their memos and their information also. But bring it back for uh, review at the regular session. Obviously, we're many, many weeks away from election time, and it will ramp up drastically as we get into the last two or three weeks. So we want you to be prepared, and we want uh, your voice to be heard prior to that point. But then you want to be active and ready to go at that point. Yes. Yes. I know we've, had, we've had some success over the last few years, um, not just necessarily saying what we're against, but what we're for. Mm -hmm. I wonder if there'd be some value in, if not in the resolution, at least in the talking points, addressing what we're doing locally already in these areas because I think um, if we don't then we leave the impression that just we have just you know that. endless con uh, endless contracts yeah, and that kind almost of almost a point by point rebuttal of the constitutional language that, and this is what we're doing, doing. Yeah, yeah exactly that this is not necessary because this is what we're doing because right. what they're being told is we're doing it just because we've done it for 40 years and that's we don't want change which is not the case because we have. And so, uh, I, and I don't know how you, I think another thing would be, I don't know who does this, but there shouldn't be a civic club or group in this community that doesn't hear us talk in some presentation format. Um, so some kind of presentation, PowerPoint, whatever it is, I don't think there ought to be a group that doesn't hear one of us talking to them about this amendment. And I do think it needs to be us, because I don't think, listen, well, the hired, the staff doesn't have the credibility. And I don't mean that negatively. I'm talking about from a vested interest you're standpoint. Like you're the peer to peer. We're, citizen we're to citizen. elected by them, and we don't have a dog in this fight other than that child. And that is the most important thing in this whole thing, is what is good for the kid. And I think think we need to be careful about saying that and I think we need to say why we think it's good for children Absolutely. because I think that that has become kind of a pet phrase that um, you know well what does that mean you know what you know it's not good for kids why isn't why it good it? for our students and I think that Absolutely. we need to be careful to not fall back on those um, just say no like, yeah, like the just say no. yeah. Yeah. but why and yeah. I think that I that's what so. our um, voters are looking for. Okay. So we will work on the administrative side to get you the information you need for consideration at the next meeting. Uh, you have a goal timeline that you, you want to adopt in September, a regular meeting, so that gives you the mm -hmm. month of October to communicate. If it, if it doesn't meet your needs, we can always tweak it and bring it back to you at study session, uh, but we'll try to get you a draft to, for consideration and we can adjust it that night if necessary. So. I think this Yes. Okay. Like we will work on it. They're going to be. I, I, I think I don't think we ought to be on the defensive here. I think we ought to take the offense. Okay. We'll have something for you next meeting. Okay. Very good. Well, we'll move on up to 9.01 uh, annual performance report, uh, educational operations, ongoing systems review. Jill will get us started. Um, Mrs. Palmer. Ms. Palmer will kick us off and then be joined at the podium by our associate superintendents to dialogue about.
evening, Dr. Frederick, members of the board. As Dr. Jungman had said earlier, we're going to do a joint presentation about our MSIP 5 results and also the OSR. Through this presentation, I'll be joined by Mrs. Moore, Dr. Hackenworth, and also Dr. Harrell. So we have our MSIP overview for our results. Academic rigor is at the heart of MSIP 5 as well as our learning model. So this is a nice complement to our initiatives that we've done through the learning model. Back in the 1950s, we started accreditation for schools um, for clarification and classification for schools. There have been five different cycles of accountability. The first one was in 1990, 1991, and now we are in our fifth cycle of MSIP 5. We have now what is called the annual performance report. AYP no longer exists, so as we were discussing earlier, with AYP it was a one shot, take a test, here's our measurements. MSIP 5 is much different than that. It is definitely based on multiple measures, which is a definite positive. We have five standards of accountability. The first is academic achievement, subgroup, college and career ready, attendance, and also graduation rate. So as before, in our AYP, standard one was the only one that we were measured on, and now we have all five. So our first one we'll look at is standards one and two. They're very similar. It just depends on the group of students that we're looking at for the results. So in standard one, high performance is status. It's the three-year average. If you think of it as a high jump, jumping over a bar, do you meet the bar or not? Or how close are you are to meeting the bar? The second part of this is progress. So as a whole group of students, how are we moving? Are we doing better than last year or maybe decrease from last year? The third part is growth, which has been our focus throughout the district for several years. Are our individual students growing throughout their whole testing cycle. So in MSIT 5 standard one, am I doing this? You're doing this. What? I'm sliding in. Okay, you're sliding in. I'm out. And, and before she goes, I do want to thank um, both Jill Palmer and Debbie Pitts for the work that they do. Um, all of this data that you're going to see that's been put together takes a lot of hours to package so that we can digest it and hopefully talk about it in a meaningful way to impact learning. So we really appreciate the work that, that we do there, that they do there. So when we look at standard one, um, we're taking that composite score of the possible 56 points in English language arts, math, science, and social studies, and we're looking at all students who are enrolled for that full academic year. And so what we've tried to capture here is the change and the uh, sustaining of progress from points in 2013 and in 2014. And so when you look at both English language arts, mathematics, and science, um, the, the points stay the same across the different uh, year spans. And we've labeled that that is the ceiling because there was a no net gain, no net loss, and that's the most possible points that are possible for those particular scores. You'll see in social studies there is a decline and um, that has actually been occurring for some time now, so we're concerned about that particular area. One of the things that, that this particular chart doesn't tell you, that the more expanded chart that the state releases that shows the rolling average is it shows the decline in the MAP index um, from those two-year rolling averages. So while these points possible that we have achieved here look pretty good, that doesn't tell the full story. And so we want to go a little bit deeper and talk about what that looks like. One of the things that you asked to see today, too, was how performance series fits into this total picture. And so I want to go back just a couple of slides here um, and, and focus on this idea of status. How are you doing over three years? Because what that tells you is over three years, are you having some sustained progress for all of those kids so it gives you that wider view and that wider lens. The next two pieces are pieces that we have not focused on in Springfield Public School with uh, the same vigor and so we have focused more of our energy on individual student gain and growth and that's a really good thing. You want every child to grow but what the state says in this way of looking at student progress is you must also grow at a certain rate to get progress. And so they look at your status and your progress or your status and your growth, whichever is higher. But to really be a continuous improvement district, you've got to sustain 
considerable progress for all students and they've got to move at a, at a fast enough rate and that's what hasn't happened in our areas and we're going to talk about that. I, I bring that up to frame what you see when you see the comparison of our map data with our performance series data. So the blue line is our map data for ELA, our proficient and advanced. The red line is SPS's map ELA, proficient and advanced. And the light green line is our performance series, proficient and advanced. And I'd also point out that that particular chart shows increments from 40 to 70 percent and what you would typically have on a data chart that would meet the MAP standard and get a student all of their points on a good data chart, you would have from zero to 100. And what would happen if we did that is you wouldn't see that variability of the different color charts there, but what you would see is almost a flat line of performance. I'd also point out that 2009 was that first year that we began using performance series, so that's why that, that uh, span of data is included there. So what you see is from 2009, you see a little bit of a bump, and then you see some flattening out. And again, if we had that on a zero to 100% grid, you would almost see a statistically insignificant movement, but a, fair, a relatively flat level of performance, which is concerning to us. And when we go to mathematics, you see a little bit more variation. Again, keep in mind if you had the axis from zero to 100%, that would flatten out. So um, some trend up and then some flattening out, but not a great deal of difference. So while the performance series provides some predictability for how we'll eventually shake out on the MAP test, what we're hearing from teachers and principals in the field is that it is not providing us with enough information to um, really get the benefits of good formative assessment and instructional support. So this past year, we have been investigating additional options. So it's not that this data isn't helpful, it's just that we would have liked our use of this performance series tool to have translated into improved performance in both English language arts and math. Um, and one of the things that we're hearing is that um, the actionable information, the instructional support piece is not as efficient to use as some of the other options that are available. So the district assessment committee beginning in August of 2013 um, at the K2 and the 3-5 level specifically, as well as the high school level, um, those people on that committee began asking for some additional tools. I don't want that to take the focus of what we're doing, but I do think that that information um, becomes important to the conversation. So I want to talk just briefly about the things that we have identified as strengths and challenges and what we as an administrative team with the people that we work with have committed to doing by way of taking action because I think, again, when you go back to what, what is the value of any of these assessments is once you know what the results are, what are you going to actually do about them? Um, we think that one of the things that is beginning to show some promise is a system-wide focus on literacy across all disciplines. Um, when we look at the MSIP measures, we are exceeding growth in both English language arts and math, and so our, our progress piece is, is encouraging. Um, a bright spot, too, is that we met the 2020 science target for the second year in a row. And um, I'm blessed because we've got the curriculum team members here. They've done uh, a great deal of work. Lori Elliott, who's our literacy coordinator. Annie Wallenmeyer, who is our uh, strategic instruction coordinator and oversees what we're doing in science. Allison Pilly, who is our director of instruction. But we think that some of the experiential pieces that are embedded into our science curriculum are also going to have a lot of promise, and we're looking at ways to increase that. Um, we've ramped up nonfiction reading, some highly engaging National Geographic uh, text uh, components for that K-5 integrated curriculum, and, and that continues to impact what we're doing. Um, most of that work started last year in about November, and so uh, we haven't had enough time to really uh, work up ahead of steam with that, but we think that that has promise for what we're doing. Right. When we look at 
Um, right. Well, I wish actually um, we avoided this particular piece that the state uh, comes out with. Um, kind of taking a page from last year, we tried to explain the rolling average, but this is really the most helpful information in terms of growth. And so, what they look at in the growth um, for English language arts. Um, When we look at the, here, yes, we're exceeding what the individual student growth is exceeding the state growth, and the metric there is 50.2. And we, 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 if you are exceeding growth, you are growing at a rate over 5% of the MAP index gap. Also, Mr. Hollisberg, the if you look at the 50.2 number on that same graph, you'll see an S beside it, mm -hmm. which indicates that's statistically significant the amount of growth as compared to the growth in the state. And so the disconnect is individual students in our district are growing really fast, but we're not making progress. If you look up on progress, we're on the floor, which means we are not growing at a rate over 1% in terms of how fast you grow. So if you were to talk about a child taking steps or we talked about a, a sprint, I'm moving, right? I'm growing, but I'm not growing fast enough. And so a rate of 3% is about an average rate of growth and that's what would get you um, at the approaching level and to be at the exceeding level, which we are in. So that's not growth in Advanced proficient advanced that is growth in the entire third grade, Insane. fourth grade of district. What they do is they is put all right? the students, all the kids line. in a pot. If you look at all the kids in a pot, they're growing. And they're growing above average. Above the state average, above right? The state so average. either they're significantly, statistically significant, that's what they are, growing faster than state average in the middle of the pack along with the state or less. So you'll see some that have an S next to it, which is the first one. So we are going faster in the ELA and math. And when you flip to the next one, you'll see we're going less. So look at the sub On the subgroup. Mm -hmm. And I, my understanding is that that pool is smaller than the whole pool because right. you have to have had a test last year and a test right. this year. You have to year. have two consecutive and it's only an ELA and math. Right. So so like students that would be mobile and would be moving out of right. district and those things would not be represented in that data set, right? right? So it limits the pool. So you can see why potentially you would score better right. when you look at whole group. And then when you look at subgroup, potentially you might not score as well, and which is exactly what right. plays out. So. Right, and so you know, we just try to keep drilling down to make it understandable and actionable. How much this helps or doesn't help, I don't know, but this have we compared this growth to our comparables or regional and the we state? We have, and we thought we would end with that cohorts. because we thought we'd start with where we are and then show you what we look like across the state. Absolutely. Okay? So then when you think about the challenges that we're faced with, we've already hit on that a little bit, that the rate of growth is not enough to get progress. So we've, we're relatively flat and we're not growing at a fast enough rate to get the progress points. And what happens is as the target goes up so that we hit that uh, top 10 by 20, the target keeps increasing, we've got to keep closing that gap. And we're not making enough progress right now with what we're doing that we're going to be able to eventually hit those targets. So that's a challenge for us. Does that have anything to do with size of the I think what I don't, I should have paid better attention in statistics. And well, but. yes and no. I, I think what you'll see when you see the cohort data and the comparables is that there are people that have some similar challenges and are, are doing a better job. And so what we are focused on is how we might improve and drive the system to improve at a, at a faster rate. Well, it could be, it could be in any of the three. You, when you look at you could have, because it's that rolling average, if you had a bad year, it impacts you for two years. But the benefit is, 
if you only had a bad year, it doesn't hurt you forever. And it gives you a better sense of how your performance over time is looking. And again, this is all based on that budget. For yeah. standard one. Standard one. Standard one. Right. Standard right. one. Right. Just, just one so we know. Right. Or, or you'll one. see. So we're putting all this <laughs> emphasis, well, all this discussion, all this comparability on a standardized test that continues to be. Well, I, I, I do think. I, I, and, and I so think everybody has this results. same challenge. Getting the same results from right. The, uh, I, I'm just I right. Just, I and I do think it's interesting because what we've done is tried to drill down into the test itself. And one of the things that we've noticed as we compare the map to the performance series assessment is that the depth of knowledge or the rigor of the questions has increased over map. We haven't seen a similar increase in what performance series is doing. Um, we're also seeing some constructed response pieces in MAP as they move to that, what I'm going to call next generation of assessments that require kids to, students to compare multiple texts and work problems that have multiple steps. We're still, I, I wouldn't hold that up as like, woo, we're where we need to be with what MAP is doing, but we are noticing a trend of those questions and in some of the assessment options that are available. Performance series still tends to be multiple choice. It's adaptive because it'll take you further, but at the end of the day, it is still a multiple choice test. So none of them are perfect, but it is the currency by which we are judged in this surrounding area. It is the currency by which parents decide where they're going to buy a house and put their child. And we believe as an administrative team that we can do better, and we think we have some strategies to, to move that needle. So that's what we are committed to doing. What you just, in a few words, the performance series has validated the results of the MAP score, the, the scores that we saw in the standardized test. Our performance series is, we think that it is somewhat a, validated so that it it's is predictive. Pre pre okay. Okay. That's. But Chris is correct. Standard one and standard two are all about MAP test or end of course exists, yes. but they're right. reinforced by the data set that we provided you around the performance series that it's flatlined also. And I also what we can provide. So I, I guess I was disappointed with the, the press coverage and kind of the tone of how that took. And I, I think I'm interested, I, I want to know where the gaps are, but I want us to be careful and say to ourselves, this is a piece of what we do. Well, and I think that's a piece that, that in our district we've tried to do in terms of some of the performance assessments that we do in the district um, and growing that formative assessment. But I do think it's interesting that, that there is a convergence with the performance series in the map. And so I just offer that as a, as a way to say, um, in some of our schools, you know, if, you're, if your child is, is performing at a 40% level of proficiency with math or ELA, all of the creative choices that we do make available if you can't read and do basic math are gonna continue to be problematic. So in my head, and I hope in all of our heads, it isn't either or, it's and. We want to continue to move the needle on this and not back away from some of the innovative and the performance task pieces and the experiential learning pieces that we're doing. So it's about and rather than, uh, instead of picking one or the other. And, and I guess the only thing I would ask is, do you think this is overall compared to data in at all students? And I think We would definitely agree. Um, one of the things that we do think is encouraging is that that data 
looks like it does in light of a uh, increase in the state free and reduced lunch rate from 46.9 to 50 percent and in our district from 49.2 percent to 54 percent so with a fairly large jump it's flat so you could almost say that that's a celebration that we haven't lost for more than we have but again we believe we can do better and we're working to put things in place that speak to what we can do better for all of our kids um, so what one thing that we noticed with standard one is that targeted focus on literacy across all disciplines we know that the k-5 integrated curriculum um, was newly adopted has an opportunity to expand the earlier that students are reading nonfiction text and giving text-based answers and processing and comparing text that's going to be an impact in middle school and high school so we want to continue that focus. We're also working in curriculum to streamline the resources so that teachers have, have a targeted focus and don't have so many different resources. And that integration across all content areas we think will continue to um, pay some dividends. So uh, standard two is really an extension of what Marty just pr presented to you. It's the, the other academic piece of, of APR. And what we're looking um, at here is subgroup achievement. So we have unduplicated counts of students who are fall within those five categories that you see there, African American, Hispanic, free and reduced lunch, individualized education plan, and English language learners. And you can see the makeup there on the side um, for our students. Um, it's important to note that students who fall within one of these categories is only counted one time um, as opposed to the to the old standards where they could have been counted multiple times so this is the other piece of the academic measure that we're looking at um, students in the subgroup are measured in the areas of English language arts math science and social studies just as they are an academic ch achievement and again they need to meet the criteria for accountability and that's that uh, basically enrolled a full academic year you can see points possible uh, in the subgroup are 14. Last year we earned 9.5, um, I'm sorry, 2013, 9.5. Uh, last year we earned it seven. So we were down a point and a half in science, a point, I'm sorry, a point in science, a point and a half in social studies, down two and a half total. When we look at um, strengths and challenges um, with regard to um, subgroup, I think uh, looking towards science is a, is a place that uh, we do have a, a bright spot, that we are still on target um, to meet the 2020 um, target. So that's a, that's a positive, even though we were down slightly from 2013. Um, the challenges are obvious in the super subgroup. Uh, we have a large gap between our all students and students that fall within that subgroup category. Um, at the same time, um, progress remains um, either flat or slightly down for that particular group of students. Marty mentioned um, many of the continued actions that we're focused on for uh, academic achievement. Those are the same for what we're currently doing for students that fall within that super, um, super subgroup. The integration support for all schools has been a real focus for us. Curriculum, professional learning, Title I, educational operations have all aligned their services this year um, to provide the necessary support that schools need to improve in this area and that goes for materials training etc Marty also mentioned we have a system-wide focus on improved literacy instruction we're working with principals and teachers to better integrate literacy across the content areas uh, that was a, an obvious gap that we noticed and we're working to improve in that particular area um, additionally improved use of progress monitoring to identify and address individual needs through customized learning experiences again we've touched on that a little bit already we're in the process of piloting and or implementing um, a couple different software solutions iReady and Alex are a couple you've probably heard of uh, we believe those um, provide an, an increased alignment to the changing standards that we're dealing with they also provide teachers the ability to progress monitor more frequently which allows us to um, enact change and inform instruction at a much faster rate. So we're excited about that uh, possibility. Uh, we're also in the process of ramping up our intervention efforts to make sure that we're providing targeted support to 
all students, regardless of their levels of proficiency, uh, making sure that we're catching everybody. And again, as we mentioned, we're looking to the performance of our local, our regional, our state, and our aspired, aspired districts and schools to see, uh, to, to, to find those that are excelling in this particular standard and to see what we can learn from those particular schools and districts. That's standard two in a nutshell. Questions? And I know the duplication of students has always been a problem, and I know they've tried to correct that. I'm not sure I still understand exactly when they're in more than one of the subgroups, they're only counted once. So, how, what are they counted in? Yeah, which one How do you determine? It's, it's a whole thing, it's a super subgroup. Right. And it's all a standard two. So standard one is all of our students. The okay. students that are in the subgroup are in standard one. Are those five those subgroups? Five subgroups. Okay. They make up the super they subgroup. They were chosen, they were the lowest That's five performing in the state. Do, well over half do, of they, our do they separate? Correct. Do they break down the, the for individual? They don't, but for our we have records of. Now, are they still counted in only one, or they're still counted in multiple when we look at? If you're in the subgroup, you're in the subgroup. So if you're a free okay. lunch student that has an IEP, you're So we still have duplication when you look at the breakdown. Right. But from a state standpoint, it's only in the super subgroup that they're counted once. Okay. That's correct. And oftentimes, oftentimes, I think a real critical point to this is when we hear the terminology subgroup, you know, we assume a, a smaller but we're going to have many buildings, especially when you look at free and reduced rate, where the vast majority, in fact, nearly the entire building right. is going to be in a subgroup. Does this still take 30 kids to make a subgroup? Or yeah, they change at the end? Well, we don't know. If it's combined, yes. Yeah. If you had a situation where you had less than 30 in all those categories combined, you potentially wouldn't have a subgroup. Right, but we don't have any. And we don't have any. Actually, it would be. I can't like, just add all these percentages. No, no, no. no. It wouldn't be less than fifty-five percent, basically. It's still a heck of a lot of kids that yes. were fall, that are falling short. That's I mean, it's, that's it's, correct. And. Or, or whatever. My concern is that we can, can we make an effort to separate the noise from the important information in this report. Uh, one of the things that strikes me is the super subgroup has all sorts of stuff because the interventions that you would put in place for an IEP student I think are significantly different than you'd put in place for a free and reduced lunch student or a Hispanic learner or an English language learner. And yet we group them and report them all together. So it, it, instead of you know looking at how we're doing and, 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 and reporting that back to us, because I think sometimes we start agreeing with the universe the state gives us, which says this is the universe you shall be judged on, and we're going to discuss whether we did well or not. Instead of you telling us, here's what's really important in our schools. I thought performance series was going to be something that, that was going to be a lot more relevant to whether or not what's going on in our schools was good last year, not so good last year, and what can be changed. I'm, I'm hearing now that maybe that doesn't get all that, but you know, this super subgroup conversation, again, the state respond, reports it, we get a score on it, and we don't do well, or we do well, or, and we, we look at it, but, but it, it strikes me that, that 
I don't know that we've done a good job of separating the important information in this report from the non-important. And I think what you're getting here is just a encapsulation of what the data tells us, what the state's telling us. But if you go into our buildings, they're not looking at super soccer. They're looking at these kids as individuals, right? They're looking at about a special ed kids, IEP, or they're looking at this free and reduced population students, individual needs, and how we intervene and make gains for those kids. This is just how the state groups them to say, how are you doing with kids that have at-risk tendencies, right? So they, instead of doing it the unfair way of used to be classifying them seven different times and counting it against you seven different times or six different times, they've lumped them, right? Well, it's, it still tells us we're not doing very well with them, but we're not lumping them at the building level. We are breaking them down from what I've seen so far in the data about what do we need to do to intervene <coughs> individually, not well, Do you think one example that we've uncovered as we've looked at some of the data and taken a deeper dive into it is that we've got some students that don't have their basic phonics background and phonological awareness to be able to get to decoding. And so we've iReady and some of those metrics have helped us identify that and then provide a treatment to close that gap. Does every child in our district K2 need a phonics base? No, a lot of kids are coming to the door with it. But if you don't build that base for the kids that don't have it, they'll never be able to decode, they'll never get to comprehension, or it'll be a really uh, time intensive fight. The earlier we can treat that and close those gaps, the, the better we can, do, we can do. We notice that's a gap with our free and reduced lunch students and our ELL students. So in some cases, the treatments are separate. Um, what a student might need in an IEP, but there's also a, a core piece of just good strategic instruction, vocabulary development, that's a piece of what we're able to mine out of that and then provide that treatment for those students that need it. So good strategies and good instruction all those. It's important to note that all this data can be pulled at, at that different level, right? So it just doesn't come to us this way anymore. If we want to look at free and reduced students at this campus, at this grade level, and look at their individual item analysis, we can do that and look for strategies that get after those things. So it's still ability to give us very much more specific feedback than we're, what we're giving you right now. Well, actually, the benefit of that to you and Carlos, even if the student took this, what your report that you're seeing is only pulled out the daily three students. So one day over half the time. But when principals go into Cognos, they get everybody who took the test. So it doesn't limit it just to full academics. It's anybody. So they could have bounced from three different schools. They're on the school accountability for the district, but principals still have access to that data. So that's definitely a good But this gets back to a question I had probably over a year ago, and that is we know that there's some um, Sorry, title schools. Uh, I think a couple of years ago, three title schools that did better than non-title schools. And so are you looking at those and seeing which are those schools and what are the factors, perhaps? Is there a common factor? Is a variable factor that made them successful that the others are not? And so that's one of the things that you are working on. Absolutely. Good. Yeah. Good. And those are things that we don't just look internally. I think we have to stretch ourselves and look at it. Or if it were, again, we could just say, okay, let's look at our data, let's just stay mm -hmm. and learn only from Springfield. We yeah. have to look at title schools and look at Sylvanians and Lewis and, mm -hmm. and our neighboring districts that might be having success that we're not having success in some areas. And we need to go and investigate that and yeah. see if there are opportunities to learn from them uh, also. Good. I think, too, when we talk about super subgroup and, and looking at those as, as individual students and for varying needs, I think the, the move towards One of the you know, I think one of the limitations of the performance series is we take a snapshot middle of year and then we do what happens at the end of the year and we Begin. try to treat them then. Yeah, we so we're going to be able to start doing this every four weeks and you know, even, even more than that with changes. But that will really, I think, inform teachers and inform instruction. So those individual students and teachers are going to be dual merge on a monthly basis. And just what we've seen, and we don't want to get into that tool conversation. Right. That's really but it's user friendly, gives much more act or timely feedback. Teachers don't have to pull as many reports. Yeah. It will help them diagnose from which what we want to do is save all the time for the teachers to build relationships with kids and get to work. 
not be manipulating and managing the data. And we're looking for the best tool to help us with that. Uh, so that's kind of standard two. I think let's get into the college and career readiness standard three. Uh, we've got three more standards, I think, to get you through, uh, and we'll keep on trucking. We do have three more standards, and, and two of these standards are going to be dealing with college career readiness and the graduation rate. And uh, when we think of college career readiness, we think of graduation rate. One of the things that, that typically comes in, obviously, is the high school and the high school experience. But I want to take just a moment before we get started on this, because there's a lot of really, I think there's some shining stars in here that I certainly want to celebrate. And there's always areas we can improve. But the reason that we're here celebrating some of these things today is because of the pre-K through 12 focus that this district has really focused on since 2005, 2006. And we'd be remiss not to, I would be remiss not to really show some appreciation for our middle schools, elementary schools, and the focus they have had in moving this, these kids on through the system as we get them in high school, because we've really seen some benefit. When we look at standard three, College career readiness, there's going to be a set of six indicators, and they're grouped in three different subcategories. So indicators one through three are dealing with the percent of graduates at or above the state standard on approved measures of college readiness. And those are uh, many of the staple assessments that, that we've been aware of many, many years, ACT, SAT, ASVAB, uh, and the COMPASS exam all fit into this particular um, category. Indicator four are those graduates who, who earned a qualifying score, qualifying score on advanced placement, international baccalaureate, or technical skills assessment. Uh, we do offer both the advanced placement and international baccalaureate uh, courses, or they were involved in advanced coursework like dual credit, dual enrollment type of courses. And then the last indicators for standard three are the percent of graduates who attend post-secondary education. We struggle a little bit here in this one. Um, because it becomes more difficult to really track these students down and get a good idea of, of where, they're, where they're at after they've graduated. So there's a little bit of a difficulty there, uh, but all in all, in, in all areas here, you know, again, we're not completely satisfied, but we feel like we are performing well. So when you look at points earned in 13 versus points earned in 14, you'll see, whoops, you'll see that we declined slightly in area 3.13. There's two reasons for that. Uh, the primary reason is the percentage of students who uh, scored in that area at or above state standard on approved college measures uh, was pretty flat. We were at 61.5 last year, 61.4 this year. Last year, that number uh, put us into the, um, my categories are off, Jill, not on target, on target. I apologize. On, on, on target, however, that particular cut score increased. So the hurdle got higher. We remained flat. The hurdle got higher. We didn't get over to the point to be on target, so we lost a point and a half there. When we look at standard 3.4, uh, advanced placement, international baccalaureate, and dual credit, you see again that we're receiving the, the top number of points, which is 10, and thus we're at the ceiling at that particular category. And then with standard 3.5 and 6, the percentage of graduates who attend post-secondary education or in the military or placed in occupations directly related to approved high school career education. Um, we are staying flat in, in, in getting that information to some extent and also in make sure that we're pursuing students into a college and career component. So the strength that you see here is that we are on target in, in standard 3.4 to meet the 2020 goal. We meet the 2020 goal, excuse me, in 3.4. And our annual percentage of students Scoring at or above state average increased in all three categories. So we're very, very pleased with that. Continued challenges are increasing the qualifying scores on nationally normed assessments. You know, we're going to get into a, a little bit of a different scenario in years to come as we are part of what is happening with MSEP 5 is that expectation for students, all students, to take one of those nationally normed assessments. And so as we increase the volume of students taking it, we're going to have to increase our focus on an effort making sure that they all continue to perform at a very high level. And there's some difficulty then, again, as I mentioned earlier, following up with these students once they leave our system and trying to get that information back on where they have gone after this into their post-high school careers. Uh, a real key is a continued development in the community of a college-bound awareness and, and, and the focus around a college-bound expectation. Now, when I say that, 
Does that mean every student has to go to college? No. But it also means that finishing at high school is not going to be the end game. A student has to go on beyond high school, whether that be military, whether that be a, uh, a college or a university, whether that be technical training, whether it be some other level of advanced training, that concept of continuing to improve themselves and prepare themselves for the workforce is a continuation. So it's called college and career readiness, and I think we get focused sometimes on the college word in there, but it's more than that. So by incorporating a, a community where the expectation of going beyond high school is just the norm and continue to enhance that, we'll continue to see improvement with that area. Yes, sir. On each one of the indicators, is the information where you can drill down to see, you know, we got a six out of ten for like indicators five and six. Well, is it from kids going on to college? Is it going to careers? Or do you know which one or indicator one? Is it the ACT we're not doing as well on or ASVAB? Or do, do we have that information for you, not us, but to, to drill down and say, we need to work on, I didn't know if we got that information, we do. that specific. We satisfied with this, so we actually have our own reports to okay. recreate and you continuously dig down and, and make sure that we're making sure everything really okay. so yeah, absolutely. I, you know, I was thinking, well, we scored six out of 10 for indicators five and six. Is that, you know, not enough kids are going to college or post-secondary or they're not getting jobs or what how do we strategy how, how do we strategy put a strategy together to resolve that to get it to a and eight five and nine. six is different than the other two because a lot of it is a reporting feature because we have to find where these students are I understand and that. so there's been great strides in special ed that's changed this year to go and actually find where those students are to make personal phone calls because a letter home doesn't get it so and do so we get penalized for not making contact Yes, no it's the, it's the percentage. No that's a penalty. Yes. It's the percentage yeah. of students that we are contacted. So Chips. we need to put a chip, <laughs> right? There's lots of ways that you, know, you can to, to game the system. I mean, well, so in reality, we sort of reality the, the, the students that we made contact with, that we know where they are, what would be the difference in score if, I mean, I'm asking a, probably a rhetorical question There's, here. Yes. Answer, I understand, but I would say it would be significantly different if we didn't get penalized for the ones we can't find. That what? certainly plays a it's, plays a significant role, and if you think of last year, for instance, we would have had more than 1,600 graduates, and so during this school year, in fact, Mr. Schmitz is beginning the work within the next month or so. We're going to start getting those phone lists ready, getting those email contacts ready, and start trying to get a hold of those 1,600 students to say where are you and what is it that you're doing and so the percentage of students who are going on beyond is going to be part of that and then the number that we're able to make contact with is also a part of that it seems like though that's something when we talk about learning from other districts if you don't have no bad stats i do but um you know you look at some of these comparable districts who have well maybe not quite as many graduates as us but certainly comparable mm -hmm. and they're not losing that somehow it looks like they're getting to those people so I mean it sounds like that's a, a perfect example of it's the same thing when I've said about math testing in high schoolers and you know people said well our high schoolers don't care about the math test well then every other high schooler in the state of um, Missouri does and ours don't you know I mean I think I understand it's an opportunity to yes there's a place where we can certainly find Try to, uh, to steal good ideas and good processes, absolutely. But again, this is, this is another thing of appearing to be a lone wolf. You know, if somebody graduates from high school and goes into the family business, starts working for their parents, what if they're not in a high school career and they're just coming in one six months after graduation? Doesn't necessarily tell you about them or their successes. So somebody that goes to Harvard but then doesn't want to tell us about it, well, we failed that student. So you know, we get to this point where we're chasing the tail of Desi, and sometimes we need to chase it, and sometimes we need just to let it go on by. So you know, I would hope that we would take a close look at what's 
really important here, chase those, put effort into those, and the ones that don't really mean much, okay, we'll report them out, we'll discuss them, but I think our community is smart enough to know that, um, that a kid that goes to Harvard is a success, even if he doesn't tell us about it. Um, I, but under this indicator, he's not. Maybe. That's a failure. I, and I think the, the, this is exactly the conversation you know, I tried to kick off last month was about we need to agree on that. We need to have a real collective conversation. And that's why it's part of the listening and learning tour. What do we believe? What do we believe represents a quality education for a Springfield Public School graduate? And how are we going to measure it? Because that drives strategy. That drives what we do as administrative uh, team and what our teachers do. We have to have a collective conversation on what that is. Uh, and agree to it because current strategic plan, as I evaluated today, and the teacher will uh, tell you, has 180 measures. 180 measures. And we don't need 180 measures. We need to agree to collectively what are the right measures and get after those things to make sure that they mean something for our kids and for our community. But so there is noise. There's noise in this. There's noise in what we're doing ourselves to the system at this point. So we have to clarify that. So we are pulling weeds. Standard four is the attendance rate. Now, by MSEP 5, that measure is based on the percentage of students who are attending 90% of the time or more, with that goal being 90% of your students attending 90% of the time or more. So we'll, you'll often hear us, the, the lingo has been our 90-90 kids. And so sometimes I think we use those types of, that type of vocabulary. We don't stop and explain it. That's what we mean when we're having that particular conversation. And so last year, uh, I, I truly am one for, for recognizing things that do impact situations. But, I, I, you know, Ms. Callan, I'm probably one of the worst for the no excuses component, and I, and I understand that. Um, but I do want to say that we had some things that impacted this last year when you look at 10 snow days and when you look at other incidents that would have occurred. And so to maintain uh, relatively statistically flat uh, I want to make sure that we, we do pat the backs of the attendance officers and our building principals and our teachers who are promoting those students to get in there and, and get those things and get here. Uh, we actually have increased over the last two years by slightly over 300 students on our actual raw data in the sense of number of enrollment. And out of those total number of students, we've increased over the last two years 130 that are, have attended more than 90% of the time. So when you get it down to that individual, you start talking about kids, that's pretty powerful. And so 130 more students have been here 90% of the time or more than what were there two years ago. So very proud of the work here uh, and the effort. Obviously, you see we earned seven and a half points out of 10, so we can get better and we'll continue to focus on that. And then the graduation rate. Um, again, I mentioned earlier on in the conversation, I, I'm very proud of the performance here, very proud of our schools, K through 12, but specifically, obviously, I've taken a great deal of pride with, pride with our high schools and the effort that has come into play here with graduation rate. And for two years running, we've been at the ceiling, reaching and, and earning all 30 points. There are multiple routes, again, that you can earn the 30 points, but the cohort rate, the in my mind, what may be the most difficult measure to reach is by doing so at four years. So those students who enter their freshman year graduate when they're seniors. And for our cohort rate this year for four years, um, we earned, we were at 89.4%. Point, uh, 89 so I'm, I'm very proud of that. That graduation rate has increased by 11% over the last four years. Uh, in a couple of specific areas, our students who are on free and reduced lunch have increased by 18% over the last four years in graduation rate, and uh, our African American population has increased by 18% on graduation rate over the last four years. And again, that's not something, I mean, our high schools are working very, very hard and very proud of the efforts they do, and then I pat every one of them on the back every time I get a chance, but this isn't something that just happens in the high school. This is about a community. This is about a K-12 focus, and so we're very pleased with that. Still work to be done to reach the expectation of, of the 2020 target. We need to hit 92% uh, graduation rate with our four-year cohort. So 
a lot to focus, a lot of work to get done. I uh, had a conversation today with, with Dr. Jungman, and, and he helped us recognize a route to where we could look at that individual student in the sense of how many students out of this cohort group do we need more to graduate. So kind of a different way of looking at it than just percentages, actually getting out of that raw number of students. Um, and so we're going to kind of approach that from a different route because we've made a lot of headway, and now the gains are going to get more difficult. And so that's, a, that's going to be a good conversation we had today and, and a continued focus for us. So those are the, the MSEP 5 standards as we are measured for MSEP 5. Uh, and I know that Jill and, and Ms. Moore have some other things they want to share. We, we have a question here real quick, Mr. Lee. Before you get into the cohorts, and my, my question is, and I'm not sure, I'm not sure where I'm going, so be patient just for a second here. You've got five standards or five areas we're talking about with achievement, sub <coughs> subgroup, college, career. Can you talk a little bit about the relationship between the five? Because they're not five silos. Right. Mm -hmm. There, is, I mean, we see an increase in graduation rate. We see an increase in attendance rate, which I always thought would have been, quote, butts and seats is a great thing for the kids to be in class is a good indicator. When those go up, but the achievement is not falling in line with that. How, how do we wrestle with the relationship between the five categories and try to make sense of, you push on one, wh what it impacts the other one, and, and, and how does that, and I'm rambling here a little bit because I don't know I, I what I I'm trying to get to, but the, the five are not independent, and so how do we deal with that? The, and I'm speaking solely, this is Justin, we've not had that particular conversation, so if I say something you don't agree with, it hit me with something. I think that for many, many years we have, and, and Mr. Lee, you've been on the board for many years, so you've, you've heard these conversations. Dr. Jungman has brought that same concept again when, with his arrival, that relationship piece. And that relationship piece is so critical. When we build those strong relationships, we're getting kids here. And we're getting those strong relationships that are allowing us to help students move through. We've got to continue with that focus. We can't lose that focus and that strong relationship is critical. But that next piece is improving the engagement. And I think now that we get them in the buildings and we get them here and they're working with us, we've got to continue to find ways to better engage them, to let them be their lead learner in that process. And I think that's where that achievement piece is going to kick in. And that is the relationship. You got to get them here, then they can perform, and then you can send them on their way. And, and so that's just me speaking, but I, I think that next challenge too is to build on that relationship and to know what individual student interests are because you can do rigorous curriculum through the lens of what's relevant to each person se seated at that table. And when you look at our choice and innovation component pieces and you see kids that are literally lost in the flow of learning, uh, class doesn't have a beginning and end, they're not looking at their watch. We can translate that experience across all disciplines. And so we've, we find that it's not unusual that science is a little bit, although there's some, some variations across different content areas, it is the one piece with that experiential. You see very few science classes when you go across the building that are sit and get. They're up, they're moving, and we can translate that and, and are in the process of looking for ways to do that across all curriculum areas. And that's why that rigorous relevant curriculum is at the heart of what we've got to do. And you can't know the relevant piece without the relationship. So is that chicken or the egg? Does attendance drive and then engagement or does engagement drive attendance? Yeah. We, we exactly. We, we have to absolutely yeah. work on it both ways. Very good question. It's an upward spiral or a downward spiral. That's exactly right. Yeah. And we just got to keep spiraling up. And the work is underway. Right? So it's just moving it. Absolutely. So, of course, there is additional information that you can get from DESI, as well as just a reminder that the most current results are always available on the website. On that home page, go to data and statistics. I guarantee you that there are more ways to look at any of these <laughs> facts and figures. We got charts. We got uh, lots of thinking about uh, what the data means, and we try to really make it meaningful for end users, especially at the school sites. One of the things that Dr. Jungman has challenged us to do is to move beyond looking within our own district and across school sites. Um, it's, it's valuable information to know why one school in one part of our district 
is outperforming another school that looks very similar and what lessons can be learned there. But there are also things that we can learn from looking at the regional and state comparables and then the Aspire to comparables. And so this just gives you a little bit of information about how these were selected. And then what you have are lots of different ways that you can look at this and ways that we are looking at this to be able to see lots of different component pieces. And I know that one of the coming attractions is for individual sites to have their own comparables at the elementary, middle, and high school level, both within our own district and then across the state and across our region so that, so that there is an effort to know who to connect, who's your phone a friend to say, you know, what do we notice here? So a, as you look across the, the different information and here we're just looking at demographics and so you have the performance rank for 2013, 2014 um, and then alphabetical, we, we went with putting Springfield at the top just to make it a little bit easier so you can see um, where we are but we tried to give you a comparison of enrollment free and reduced lunch, and then the different subgroup components. And, and what we find is that there is a story, like there is a story for each of our own schools. So you see places with high free and reduced lunch that are doing a better job sometimes, and sometimes places with low free and reduced lunch that aren't doing quite as good of a job. So it's just interesting to be able to look at this a lot of different ways and to see what that comparison tells us. Um, this chart, go ahead. some districts here that we chose to take out um, you know because their performance consistently wasn't one that we wanted to measure ourselves um, against so I guess I would also say that these categories I feel should be up for discussion um, before we settle on is this who we really want to compare ourselves to um, because you can always make yourself look better <laughs> But again, it goes back to what Andy was saying. Is it, are you just playing the numbers game? You know, or, so what are we doing for our students that really helps us? And that's really why we try to group three, create three groups. One is who are most like you, and that's your statewide, and then you get to your regionals who are the ones that you're gonna be compared to in every newspaper article or by Maybe. peers, right? Just because they're next to us. And then who are the top 5% of districts in the state? Who are the ones that are knocking the socks off in every category? Now they've got some significant advantages that we don't have, but if there's- But if you don't aspire to that, then you never hit that. And so- If there's ones you want us to consider that we think are better comparables, uh, but we don't think it's an accurate depiction, we do go with comparison statewide. Because I think a lot of things that are on the web chat today are about who do we want to collaborate? Who do we want to be? about that is not so much who we compare to that we get wrapped up in that as much as who's doing things well right. and who can we, we can learn from learn from and I don't care if it's a school of 2,000 kids if they've got something that works that can that's transferable to a district of 24,000 that's great whether we compare to them or not that's what we want to, so I mean, you're comparing to everybody from the standpoint of best practices. And, you know, I don't want to get wrapped up in the numbers and say we only want to compare to these. Right. And what are they doing well? Because there's 520, 500 other districts out there that's probably got something that we can steal. Again, it's, it's all about that actionable information. And so again, here's the state comparables and then being able to see the, mo the movement from last year to this year. I think that chart at the bottom gives some meaning to some of the information that Desi shared. And it just shows relative to each of those five areas um, who lost, who, who gained, who stayed the same and who's already where they need to be. 
and then of course you know you can go crazy with the other um, pieces but but you start to see people that have some of the same challenges with subgroup performance and and what can we learn from them and 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 where do we go moving forward um, just another way again to see that same chart that's here at the bottom spread out by who are the names and so you what you see is that places that are maybe doing really well with all kids might not be doing quite as well with their subgroups and actually lost points so again just just looking at at things different ways gives you a different context and some different actionable information to take forward um, this isn't to spend a lot of time a lot of this can be sorted pretty quickly in an Excel chart but just looking in, at the problem from lots of different ways and, and looking at that actionable information you'll see the same thing with the regional comparables again a picture a snapshot of the demographic data of those that are around us and how that impacts the challenges I, I mentioned this before too but I don't know if, if, if it connected the 2013 the 14 15 data <coughs> sorry the 13 14 data won't be released till October or November so they push to get all the APR stuff out so that's why this is uh, a year behind in terms of the demographic data again here's how we look uh, based to those who are nearby to us and you'll see um, a lot of the folks around us are already at the ceiling and then specifically um, we're doing really well with that graduation rate and some opportunities for improvement with our comparables and then our aspire cohorts give you a chance to look at who they are demographically and then looking at the loss gain maintenance in terms of effort many of them also are at the ceiling and then again seeing that even the best of the best um, lost ground with their subgroup performance it's an ongoing challenge of course when you're at the top of the heap uh, it's harder to to stay at the top um, but it just provides a little bit more context for the data and the purpose for all of that is that taking that action is what we're challenged to do that's why we went into education trying to move the needle for every child every day um, and provide that quality learning experience across the board I know you've received a, a great deal of information I'm going to try to, to sum up I know uh, another component um, educational operations ongoing systems review OSR uh, was due to the board this evening and you do have that document a, a huge component of the document is the MSEP 5 performance piece because again though we all know the different the different ways that we should measure children and we, and we do in the district but when you look at accreditation this is kind of the, the, the concept so it's a big part of what, of what we are in the operations end of it so Dr. Hackenworth and I are here to answer any questions if you have anything beyond that with our ongoing systems review actually to the regular meeting it's not too dense at this point and cover it I, it's just going to be an overview because like you said the majority of the data was just covered but we can dig in and let you look at the other pieces Absolutely. also yeah. I know it's been a long night Springs, every one of them lost in the 
super subgroup. My guess is that the vast majority of that super subgroup is free and reduced lunch. You can almost flip our academic achievement around and it's a, almost a straight graph of, of poorest schools, worst, school, worst scores, wealthiest scores, best schools, scores. You know, we have got to figure out a way to focus, to be intentional, to measure, to see what works, to see what doesn't work because uh, it, it's just abundantly clear to me that, that we still don't have a handle on that. I don't know that a lot of schools do have a handle on it, but we're not. This, this nation doesn't have a handle on it, and that's exactly the conversation we need to continue to have. But there, but there are things that work. Yeah. And, and, you know, we throw money. Title I, we throw money. Um, and does that work? <coughs> Some say they made staunch to the lady. I don't know, but, but these things every year just, just – hit home to me that we're not close to figuring that out and and we need to we need to be aware of that we need to be intentional about that and we need to be bothered by that I that's when you know that half the students that that that, that half the students fit in that subgroup and this is where we're we're struggling and that other places are struggling, you know, the ones that we think are good districts are, are struggling too. Um, the district that figures this out is going to be is going to end up being the good community. We're going to have we're going to have a better community, and that's that. Still, after four months on the school board, that's the reason why I'm on the school board is for the community, and. If we let down these kids in 12, 15 years, we're going to let down the community. And this is, it's, it's, not, it's not going to get any better until we decide to get better by, these, by this subgroup. Um, this, this is bothersome for me. Um, the other thing that's, that bothers me is, is that the, this curve is going down and it's, I still don't know what it is that's when we should reasonably expect this curve to bend the other direction and what it is that is going to make this bend the other direction. Yeah. We haven't heard that. I think we need to, like you talked about, we need to find out who's bending the curve in the other direction and have some real conversations about what are they doing and what are we not doing and can we identify those? Often talk about in research, but they're so hard to find. Ninety percent <laughs> poverty, ninety percent proficiency rates. You know they are making great gains, but uh, they are the anomaly in the data. And we've got schools that are making great gains, but it, we're not there. And we're certainly not there as a whole population. And I, I appreciate Chris's point that this is not the only measurement. This is no. not the only thing, but it's got to be part of the puzzle and part of our our call is to really reach each one of these kids and help them because we know. Some of these are minimal expectations of proficiency in reading and math, and they are life skills that we have to help make sure that they have in order to be successful. But also, these children don't come to us in a vacuum. I mean, they are part of this community. They are part of, um, they actually spend more time outside of the school walls than they um, uh, spend inside and so you know I, I guess the frustrating piece to me is we have you know children who are from families who really care but who's both parents or one parent may be working two or three minimum wage jobs just to make it ends meet they don't have somebody to do homework with them every night um, so at some point we need to, as a community, holistically look at who are these children that are coming to us and are there pieces of those challenges that actually can be better addressed by, you know, entities outside of the, of the school. You know, and I think that Springfield is uniquely positioned 
and has been in the past to bring those uh, entities together to, um, to, to address those gaps. And so, um, again, the eight of us can sit around here and, you know, administrative, but it, like, it's, it's not a problem unique to Springfield. It's not a problem unique to Missouri. On the other hand, I do think we are uniquely positioned in Springfield to make greater gains than other communities. And I guess that's what I hear you saying, Tim, is, you know, and, but we have to also um, let, let those other, and, and expect those other um, influences to step up and take responsibility. But it may take more leadership on institutional leadership. Agreed, right? Agreed. Because, because a lot of it impacts a lot of the burden ends up here and uh, and that uh, one way of looking at it is saying yes we need to come together as a community and I couldn't agree with you more another way though is saying look if this is how we're going to get evaluated this is how we're going to get dinged then and if this is the rules that have been set up for us um, we can we can say well the evaluate the evaluation criteria are flawed or it doesn't apply to us but it it's there it it's it's kind of like air we have to breathe it <laughs> to live and i think there's ways that we can impact that i don't think that we can ignore bad evaluation processes if there's things that we yes. need to influence we can influence was significant influence around a wide expansion of assessment that was going to play out this year if it wasn't for educators kicking back on a plan and they changed that so and now that we better. come back to the policy piece. Right. so yeah. we can impact policy we can influence the state board of education and and things that if we have better solutions that are better measurements we need to be pushing that conversation <laughs> forward uh, but we can't just make excuses without engaging in the conversation so we have to engage up and we have to get out of our community and we have to engage in our community because I agree with what you both said that we are called to lead that work in our community absent our leadership in that conversation about engaging our stakeholders and our partners it will not happen that's right and we, we need to be a district that people come to because we're hand in hand yeah. we have schools where they have 90 percent pretty reduced or 90 percent you know we need to be those I think in a big the district size that we are to point to all the great things that are going on in this district. You know, there's an amazing uh, number of great great folks in this district. And there are an amazing number of great kids that are getting <laughs> terrific education exactly. in the school system. You know, you look at the you pull out the you pull out certain schools to match Ozark, Nixo, Willard Oak there's no difference. Rockwood, I mean so you can you can cut these things any way you want, but it's certainly but we're, that sometimes masks, it can mask the, the, the problems. And, and uh, I think we've shown that when we do focus on things, as a district, as a community, we can get things done. But, but I think it is that, that, that willingness to, to say we're going to stay on this until, until this, is, this is changed, this is turned. But uh, just, we get a, how many years have we gotten a report? I, I've gotten one 21 years. Um, and so we get a report and we, you know, performance series was just a measurement. It, it was a measurement, not a test measurement type of thing to say we're doing better. We're going to find a way to measure, to do ready. Um, I saw I ready today. And, and what they were doing to know where students are so teachers could teach from that point so it's again and it's monthly you can put down the score to see there but we we've had so many um, instructional strategies come through Springfield public schools in years I've been here and I I just 
how long will we take to look at these 90 to 90 schools and how long are we going to take and then when are, is, is the report next year going to be? Um, I just, I don't know, I, I'm just like, I think we ought to go down a path. Um, you know, and I, at some point, and you're listening to the community and what they expect, but at some point we need to go really fast <laughs> down some path so we can get, you know, because otherwise it'll be next year at the same time mm -hmm. and we'll be talking about this same report and about how this line, I mean, this this is a two or three percent. So mm -hmm. I, I don't know if it's a stick, yeah. uh, you know, yeah. significant or not significant. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I just know at 55 or 50 percent is n not good. We ought to be heading up, up this direction, you know. So when are we going to, I just, we allow a lot of things to go on in buildings and we all would agree, oh, at best decisions are made at that level. Sometimes if they have the information, they need to make good decisions. But if they don't have the right, it's all about, and you all mentioned it, relationships, but then it's instructional strategies that work after you've done that so I don't think anybody's got the secret out there I think if we keep looking um, some of you will have served 21 years or 25 years <laughs> and we will still be looking I, I, I truly believe we have people and in this district so I guess I'm one that says you know we can travel all over the country we can talk to all these people we can bring them in I believe we have people right here who have figured this out. I believe they have. And they're out there in the buildings right now doing it. And they're doing it with kids that fall in the super subgroup. And they're getting those gains. And I think we've got them right here. And we w it wouldn't take us that long to look at those things and say, here's kind of our prescription. Maybe you don't quite have us why the thing to get this done but I don't want to narrow it down to say you must do exactly this but I, I think if we're going to make this progress and yeah there's a lot of things the community can do and my gosh when I'm out there in the schools they're doing it my god they're volunteering they're staffing stores or they're they've got uh, uh, big brothers big sisters people there I mean they're they're every place. They're, they're, I mean, a principal say, well, I needed this, and my partner provided it, you know, just like that. I ask them, and they provide it. Well, boy, I, I don't think there's too many communities that do that. I, I mean, I really don't think that happens. So I think we've got some kind of obligation to set some kind of deadline to say, at this point in time, we're going to head down this path and here's where we're going and um, everybody um, make a decision whether you want to go with us or um, you want to go some you know do something else because I, I just um, I think it's time to fish or cut bait you know I, I really I do I, I think we can talk about this for years to come and this may slightly keep going down and I'm ready for it not to slightly go up. I'm ready for us to make some, some schools have made 10% improvements, 15% improvements within our district. They've done it. So if they can do it within those schools, why aren't we doing it district-wide? Because it didn't, they, they didn't have any magic fairy dust there. They really didn't. Uh, so I'm just, I think we're, we just, we've looked at a whole bunch of things and I'm, I'm ready for us to do something. And we may say, God, that's a bad idea, you know? But I think we've got enough measures out there with iReady and some things they can do monthly to say, whoops, kids aren't making the progress, you know? Yeah, let's, 
There's yeah, not. I think there's not. There's as I've visited schools and you've all visited schools. I know this is not for a lack of hard work. Right. This is not for a lack of hard work from our teachers and our leaders that are getting after it every day, building relationships, trying to do the best they can for kids. What tools aren't we providing them? What support aren't we providing them? What can we do to help get them what they need in order to make it happen? They want the exact same thing that you want, right? I mean, there's, and we have to have as a board and administrative team and teachers the courage to jump in and try new strategies. Uh, and we've got team members. I've heard it everywhere I visited. We're ready. What's next? Come on, let's 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 do something great for kids. We're working hard right now. Uh, and there's just a lot of enthusiasm around how we serve kids in this district. And we can do those great things, and we are. Uh, but how do we identify, isolate potentially the, the great best practices, make them system-wide while you still create autonomy? Autonomy is a piece of what is creates a great teacher, giving them some ability to breathe, to do the art of the work. Uh, so you can't create this little box that they have to fit into. Still, some autonomous cultures uh, are typically the most successful. So it's, it's not an easy. If, if it was easy, it had already been done, and it had already been done say? across this nation over and over again. But well, I've heard Ms. Moore say several times, most of the time it's not a people problem, it's a system problem. Yeah. And we need to figure out a way to engage those people in whatever, whatever it is, whatever the answer, I don't know what it is, but we need to find the resources to help them do that yeah. because you're, I mean, they're doing it. We just need to make sure that the, it's, uh, the system's out there for them to move forward like that. Other okay. feedback before we move on? Yeah. Any other comments? Okay. Let's... With all the recommendations, <laughs> all the things we've talked about, and then and then a potential relook at some of these parts and pieces, I think what I've heard from most of you, just kind of in conclusion, is that that we have the numbers, which the quantitative piece of this, but what we are looking for is the implementation, uh, and that's what we would like to see of what is working and where it's working and how we can make it work in other other locations. So. Okay, so let's move into reports from administration. 10.01, uh, our superintendent's update. <laughs> we, we met last week. You know what's going on. I updated you then, and I'll just tie it into the legislative update. We have a few more legislators coming in this week to talk about veto session. Uh, some meetings tomorrow, some meetings the next day. If you haven't responded to Kathy and you're able to make one of those, please let us know. We'd love to have board representation at each. So. Have you gotten response from all of them? Uh, not everyone. We've gotten several, but not everyone. So, yeah. so check with her after the meeting if you're uh, able to come tomorrow or the next day. That's it for me. Okay. Uh, Board of Education discussion, 11.01 uh, board comments. This is where we will, uh, you know, as a board have a discussion. I will, as the president will begin the discussion, so we'll really do this in lieu of president's report. But our last meeting was only one week ago. In addition to that, we had a three-day weekend. <laughs> so, however, if any board member had an opportunity to visit a school, it sounds like maybe one of you did, uh, or participate in a community event, please feel free to share that at this time. So if anyone went to a school or an event, Mr. Renner? Um, I wasn't here last time, so I did. I have gone to three schools now. And just what you said, everybody's working hard kids are learning I am when you when I go it's not when you go when I go I am so impressed I I mean I I just um, I'm, I'm just I just I three schools I didn't see one child doing you know something that would you know now they tell me they've got them there but they <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't see them I mean they were polite in the hall they were just I mean just everything you would say this is the learning environment we would and I know they worked hard to get it there the only other thing and I know I'm just supposed to kind of go in but people we end up talking really and having some in-depth conversation and the the one thing that I've I think I can generate I know I teach about Maslow's hierarchy of needs and basic needs and we talk about kids while we're doing certain things so they'll reach a level where they're ready to learn after safety and and hunger and some of those other needs are met 
I think I, I don't think at the board table I think I could create that same triangle with a teacher's hierarchy of needs and I'm assuming we've met the basic needs so they can strategize and look at new learning time. but I don't think we have sometimes and so I, I'm not sure I need to we need to ask those questions have the basic needs been met but when I go in buildings and there's one plug-in in a room I don't think the basic needs have been met and we've got a lot of old buildings mm -hmm. that's what there is mm -hmm. you know and so they've got new technology without the ability so then we say oh strategize and talk about all the learning things and if I was there they didn't tell me that there, there's not one that told me that but if I was in that room I'd be thinking what are you talking about I got one plug in here and we got all these computers and we got to be careful because we blow the fuse and the principal <laughs> gets shot you know so I, I'm, I'm thinking you know these are just like the rest of us that if we're not now we don't talk about that at the board level how many plug-ins we got in the room to run these things now we shouldn't be talking about that should we because I was on the board when we talked about windows and doors so <laughs> I've been there <laughs> and I really don't I, I don't want to go I don't want to go, go back, back. <laughs> I don't want to go back there because that was that it just really wasn't the kind of discussion but I think I'm assuming that some and I almost I almost I haven't done it yet but I, I think I may create my own triangle to say what are the basic needs that I'm assuming as a board member have been met and have they so that when they go in that room ready to teach we have provided them with all those things so they're they're at a level where they can feel like they've been supported and the safety needs met and the psychological needs met the physical needs met so that they're then ready to try all these new things that we're going to say here's the this is going to work if you'll just do this it, it's going to work and if you'll go with us so that's the one thing I've gotten so far is that um, the positive thing is it's just so positive to go and I said I saw all these volunteers from all these agencies and new things and the principal said I needed this and contacted a partner and it was here the next day the next day that things were delivered that they said they needed so it's like wow that's um, very you know very impressive but are we at the board level assuming some things and are others assuming some things that are out there that really are holding them holding them back and it's not because the building's just old. That's not, um, there's some wonderful things going on in old buildings, but we, I just think we need to make sure we're meeting the basic needs so when we come with these answers for our strategies for them, they're ready to embrace those and not fall back like I would on, oh yeah, here's another strategy, but I can't plug anything in, you know, or um, so. I think we just kind of work on that. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Anything? I didn't go to a building, but I did get a tonight. Got a uh, hearty thank you from the representative for our bus drivers about the new Carver facility and was praising that and, and thanking us for our actions. So I thought I would bring that thanks to you. Cool. One other thing, I saw a staff member or staff members today operate. I was waiting, and there was a parent came in with a new student, and there, uh, the where we can't call them secretaries, can we? What are, administrative assistants? I've got to have all the titles right because it's not cooks anymore. Tech, no, 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 no. They're technology technician, food technicians, or something like that. What there? Specialists. Specialists, okay. <laughs> See, I, I don't even have the right names anymore. But whoever it is, the lady came in. No immunization record. No proof of she even lived in the district. And I saw people work with her to say, now, you know, we can help you get these, but we don't have them, so we can't enroll your son today. 
but here's what we can do now. What can you, I, I saw all these things happening and then single parent having to work, needing transportation. Well, can't do that because we don't even know if where you live or my, you know, so we got to And then the nurse comes out that's full time now, which is wonderful that here's some things I can do to help you. So all at once this lady who really couldn't enroll her son that day was I thought just had some staff members wrap right around her to make sure this is going to be okay. And somehow we'll get him here tomorrow because we'll get those. We can get some health records. We'll help you get those. And you bring in that sheet that you've got where you rented the place that shows us you're there. And then we'll contact transportation. I, I just, I didn't have anything to do with teaching, but that little boy who was scared to death because he's going to be in first grade coming into a new mm -hmm. school all of a sudden had a whole lot of people yeah and he, he was from another school outside our district so it wasn't an in-district deal it wasn't anything so I just thought that was a I mean I watched in amazement for about 15 minutes with uh, and the lady left with her son where you could have thought she was really going to be mad she was uh, I thought received a lot of messages that we're waiting tomorrow and we'll, we'll get him in here and get things done, which is uh, that I think happens probably a lot of times too in our district and that had nothing to do with teaching, but I think he'll come into school tomorrow feeling good about where he's going to be. Excellent, thank you. And one last thing, uh, you might note that uh, we have our new ID tag, so there are new lanyards, so this is pretty exciting to be able to uh, stuff to check in at the office when we visit our schools but we now have a we're official we have our official mm -hmm. id tag so this is great okay um upcoming meetings uh, a couple i will mention and then the rest of you please um chime in we have um tomorrow early child promise press conference at washington baptist church and that's to showcase or highlight um the uh public private partnership for early childhood ed between Early Child Promise Initiative, Springfield Public Schools, Washington um, Baptist Church, and several other agencies. So, and Head Start, and that will be, there are several others. Um, so that is tomorrow uh, in the morning at 10 o'clock, everyone invited to attend. Um, we have ongoing meetings with legislators, will be continued as it's already been mentioned tomorrow. Um, on September 4th, Springfield Public Schools Foundation has their back to school delivery of grants to classrooms. That's a very exciting time that will start, I think, 745 breakfast and then um, the delivery of the grants, which if you've ever had a chance to uh, be in a classroom when a grant is delivered, it's an extremely exciting time. Um, Dr. Jungman will, and then I think that afternoon there's a 2 o'clock press conference to talk about those, uh, those uh, deliveries. Dr. Jungman is continuing his series of open community forums. Uh, already had one and has more coming up. And then Community Partnership Luncheon is on Monday, September 15, at 11.30 at the Ramada Inn Oasis Convention Center. And uh, there may be others that I don't have in my book that you guys might want, that you might want to mention. Anyone, anything else within the next two weeks? Uh, high school open houses. Can you send, will the rest of us, do you know if we'll get that? The chamber mailing list. I, I don't know how okay. much is on that list. Well, I know what not is, but. Um, is that open to all board members I to don't attend? Know. Okay. I, I didn't read it. I okay. Read it. I imagine it would be. Okay. Anything else? Okay. Moving on to our plus deltas. Uh, you will note that we made an arrange, a rearrangement of our table this evening based on plus deltas that came in. So we don't uh, want any in. deltas on that. <laughs> well, there is one from where the podium is. If you want to look at the, if you want to look at the, um, put that on your, I did. You can't see the screen behind it. Yeah. 
see how this works and if you have any other suggestions. But I just, I think it's important that you see that we really are um, looking at that feedback and making adjustments and, and changes as we can. So that's the, that plus delta is very important. So take a minute. I think I've seen everyone jotting them down as we've gone through the meeting tonight. So um, at this time, there, uh, there will be no executive session, so we do not need to take a vote to go into executive session. Um, hearing nothing else at this time, we've heard plenty tonight. Um, we will adjourn the meeting, so um, we're going to vote on that. So I need a motion that the board will adjourn the meeting. So moved. Second. Mr. Rosenberry, do I have a second? Second. Ms. Bush, and please vote. We will we'll come after you. <laughs> You'll be outvoted. That's what will happen. Yeah, that's one thing. You know, I'm you won't sure. win. And we're not going to reach consensus. That's not out. genuine. Okay. Since our window is not genuine. Wait, we never voted. Did we vote? Uh, Chris, I did. Is, hang on a second. Hi. Candy can enter it. I need to come up. I need to get that out of here. Oh, uh, you snooze, you lose. Come on. I want to get up. Everybody right. else in. Chris, did you vote? Yep. It's here now. Yeah, I think Andy's just in. Kathy's got everybody in favor. She'll put it in. So if, okay. you, if it's not there, she'll make it happen. So we have a majority vote to adjourn the meeting. We're out of here. Thank you. Thanks. There it is. Coconut Thank you. Cake.